Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We will call this work session to order, and thank you for being here this morning. Public comment, clerk. Do we have any public comment this morning? Yes, ma'am. Three individuals. Three okay. individuals. Okay. We respect our citizens' right to address other, their government in this meeting. However, I intend to enforce our three-minute rule as always, and to run this meeting uh, effectively and efficiently. Once uh, your three minutes have been reached and you finish your sentence, then the floor will be taken back by me. Please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against personnel or officials, which should be handled in another forum other than a business meeting of this body. The first person we have on the list this morning is Mr. John Tomaski. Uh, Mr. Tomaski, please come up, state your address, and I was looking at your subject matter. What is this term? Okay. Terminus. Terminus is your, okay. All right, Mr. Tomaski. Uh, John Tomaski, Success Institute of Parkway, Douglasville. Good morning, everyone. I'm Good speaking morning. on terminus because I want to emphasize the importance of uh, the uh, modern financial management techniques that the Vice Chairman and Chairman of the Finance Committee has been bringing uh, to this <coughs> session. Uh, the uh, terminus presentation, which I've seen at the Finance Committee, uh, presents a tool that can be used for budgeting and it's uh, something that is very facile uh, to use and it even permits rudimentary sensitivity analysis. So it's, but it is a, a small step in the right direction. As far as financial forecasting, forecasting of revenues and expenditures, uh, there really is no objective forecasting. It's still, you know, seat of the, seat of the pants, yellow pad and pencil. And um, there are uh, linear regression models, simple statistics 101, which one can use to forecast objectively. And uh, one can use varieties of these models. There are stock adjustment models. There are error learning models, which have built into the model a methodology whereby your estimates will improve over time. Also, one can simply have a regression model that accounts merely for random variation, uh, typically for trend because the Federal Reserve has a policy of building in 2 to 3 percent inflation. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, cyclicity for the business cycle. So you can have a linear regression model that will account for trend, will account for the business cycle, or will combine both trend and cyclicity. Mm -hmm. And again, these are not esoteric state-of-the-art methods. These have been around for quite a while. Linear regression analysis is more than 200 years old. It, in fact, it's 213 years ago that Legendre and Gauss had specified a uh, theorem, Gauss-Markov theorem, which showed the most efficient way to conduct a linear regression in terms of minimizing errors of estimate. So what we're doing in forecasting with the yellow pad and pencil is more than 200 years behind the times. So again, we're going in the right direction, but really there's a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamaski. We'll take this matter under advisement. I appreciate you uh, stating your opinion this morning. Hello, attorney. Next. Camel, camera being late, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have uh, Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, please come forward and state your address. And I believe your subject matter this morning is anniversary. Good morning. Good morning. Larry Pierce. 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. 
this morning I have one sheet of paper. I got good news and I got bad news. Mm. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is this month makes one year I've been coming up here. So it's my anniversary and I shall celebrate tonight. The bad news is I'm still here. <laughs> and I may be slower, but you know what? I'm not leaving the race. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I, I didn't know what anniversary meant today because I have a birthday this week and I know after a certain age you stop having birthdays, so I thought you were going to talk about my anniversary. <laughs> it's your birthday? No, it's Saturday, but thank you so much. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Happy birthday, birthday, dear Roman. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, Mr. Peters. We'll take this bad on the back. Thank you for being here one side. year. Thank you for being here with me for one year. It's been fun. Um, <laughs> you didn't have to use your gavel on me today. I sure did not. Last but not least, uh, we have Don Leonard. How do I follow that? I know. <laughs> That's tough after happy birthday. Okay, Don Leonard, Creekside Subdivision, Bomar Road. On January 29th of this year, Madam Chairwoman, you hosted the People's Town Hall or the Walk the Talk meeting. State Representative Gravely, House District 67, spoke at that meeting and asked for you to provide him with specific information on the bus system. He asked for a copy of the financial imprint for a copy of the impact study. He wanted to know what is the long-term cost to the citizens of Douglas County. And if you don't have that, then maybe you can provide what the short-term financial impact may be. He also spoke about the citizens of the county on the west side who will not be able to access the system but will bear the long-term financial burden. The citizens are responsible and on the hook when this CMAC grant runs out. So his biggest concern was, what is the cost to the taxpayers? To date, you have not provided Representative Gravely with an answer. So, when will you give Representative Gravely and the citizens of this county the courtesy of providing us the answers to these questions? Apparently <coughs> this has not been taken under advisement. On Friday of last week, I attended the transportation meeting and watched as three companies vied for our marketing and educational campaign dollars. That's $50,000. Their pitch was based on an illegitimate and loosely thrown together transportation study, not the recommended feasibility study. You cannot expect them to base their work on bad information and we should not be forced to pay for it. There is a massive opposition to this bus system and it is growing every day, even though you choose to ignore our collective voices by going forward. We are asking that you cease all operations and expenditures of the bus system while the transportation bills 930 and 386 make their way through the Georgia legislative process. It makes no sense to spend our money on a bus system when the state is moving towards their own transportation system that will eventually include Douglas County. Representative Gravely had a conversation this past week with the author of one of the bills who stated that he does not see the value in Douglas County going forward at this time and rec recommends halting the project. It is wasteful and frankly grossly irresponsible to go forward with this bus system. We strongly recommend the Board of Commissioners stop this needless waste of our hard-earned tax dollars on this pet project with no accountability or projection of costs. Bottom line, you must vote no and kill this CMAC grant. Hear us, no buses. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Leonard. We'll take your matter under advisement. And uh, thank you so much for coming in and providing your information this morning. Um, I believe that's the last of the comments this morning. Um, next we have presentations. We have two presentations this morning. Workforce Development to Douglas County, uh, and it would be um, our Workforce Development Center, Rob LeBeau, Robert LeBeau, have, have a presentation this morning, please. And welcome, and thank you for coming in this morning, Sharon. All right, good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning. Chair Chairman, thank you for inviting me to come and talk for a few minutes today about the workforce system um, and the services we provide here in Douglas County. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to introduce a couple of staff here with me here. Phyllis Jackson is part of the ARC staff. She oversees Hi. all of our career resource centers in our service area. Christine Grigsby and Dorothy Herzberg are with ResCare. They are our contracted provider uh, for several centers, including the center here in Douglas County. Um, so I'm happy to have them with, with me, and uh, if there's any specific questions, they're the people who can provide you the best answers. Um, real quickly, just to set uh, why I'm here from the Atlanta Regional Commission talking about workforce services. The Atlanta Regional Commission has a lot of different um, roles that we play within the metro Atlanta area. These here all come under the Atlanta Regional Commission Board, which, of course, Chairman Jones is a member of. And then we also have some <coughs> other services that we provide um, that have separate boards, but also come under the umbrella of the Atlanta Regional Commission. So what I'm talking about directly is ARWDB, which is the Atlanta Regional Workforce Development Board, which provides workforce services as set out under federal and state law. Um, so we have a separate board that helps advise us, but we still fall under the umbrella of the Atlanta Regional Commission. Um, in general, what is workforce development? It's an interconnected set of solutions to meet local employment needs. That's at the very basic, basic of what we're trying to do in workforce development. This is intentionally uh, confusing because the system we work in is confusing. Um, it starts with dollars we get from the U.S. Department of Labor, comes down to the Georgia Department of Economic Development, gets separated into different regions, um, and then the Atlanta Regional Workforce Board, and then the services we provide are down here. Um, and I'll talk about those services more directly. It also gets complicated because the way that we provide services in the state, uh, the federal dollars come down to the state. The state then is divided into 19 local workforce areas. So the money is distributed among those areas. We're considered Region 3 under the state system. And then in Region 3, there are actually five different local workforce boards. So it gets very confusing for our customers to figure out where do they appropriately find the services. So for the Atlanta region, ARWDB, the Atlanta Regional Workforce Development Board, we serve seven counties, including Douglas, Bay, Clayton, Henry, Rockdale, Gwinnett, and Cherokee. Cobb, <coughs> Fulton, DeKalb, and Atlanta each have their own separate workforce board. All right, so the services we provide. As the Atlanta Regional Commission, we are the fiscal and administrative agent for the federal workforce dollars. What that means is we have two customers. We work with job seekers, those that are underemployed or unemployed and are looking to upgrade their skills and find employment. And we work with businesses. These are businesses that have openings and are trying to fill their workforce needs. Getting into the details, we have different, we work with adults, youth, and the business services. The white ones here, um, the one-stop career centers, our affiliate sites, and our youth providers, we have contracts with local organizations and businesses to provide those services. Business services, working with, directly with the businesses, is internal staff to ARC. So the way we approach this is we have eight, within our service area, we have eight career resource centers, we have one mobile unit, we have 11 youth programs, and then we have business services um, which is basically work-based learning and recruitment and expansion. Let me talk a little bit more details about Douglas County. Um, within Douglas County, we have our youth program that's provided through PEP. So they are the contracted youth services provider for <coughs> Douglas County. We provide them some dollars. They have some goals that they need to, to reach by the number of uh, students that they are going to address. The focus of our youth program is out-of-school youth. These are youth uh, ages 16 to 24 that are not in school. So our goal is to help them either um, get a GED, get into additional training like a technical college, or get an employee. That's our focus. With adults, we work with uh, they, people who have been laid off, or just out of work, or underemployed. And we have several areas where we work with them. They can come into our center. Anybody can come into our center and get some basic assistance. They can do learn how to write a resume, they can do a job search. You don't have to actually qualify at, at any level to get basic services. To get intensive services, you do have to qualify, and there's a whole series of qualifications um, 
But if you do qualify, one of the great benefits we have is not only intensive counseling on job uh, readiness, but we also have dollars set aside that can send you to a school, whether it be a private organization, a technical college, a university, and get training to upgrade your skills and then get employment. Um, the one that's not on this map is we now also have one day a week we go to West Georgia Tech. We actually have an office at the Technical College campus uh, where we provide services uh, for, for students that are enrolled there. So what do the numbers look like? If you look at all of our services in the seven counties, this is the number of visits to the center. So it's just people walking in the door. Back in 2012, we were at almost 60,000. You see the numbers trending down to last year, about 33,000 visits to all of our centers. Correlates directly with unemployment rate. So as we have less people looking for jobs, we have fewer people coming into our centers, which makes sense. Um, enrollment numbers, so the numbers of people visiting have gone down, but the people who have enrolled, who qualified and enrolled for intensive services are remaining about steady. They've, they've dropped down a bit from 2012, but they're remaining pretty steady over the last five years. And then the youth enrolled, same thing. Last year we dropped off, but the youth enrolled are remaining steady. So the Career Center visits here at Douglas County. So we're very happy to have um, used the, the, the county facility over on Club Drive. You can see the number of visits, people who walked in the door, 5,000 in 2012 to about 3,800 in 2017. So trending as normal with the others. A little bit of a blip here and there, but still trending down as the number of visits. Um, we also have a mobile unit. This unit has 12 workstations thereabouts. Yes. Um, and it travels around all of our service area, typically to libraries, but also to other locations because it has started coming here to the uh, administration center one day a month. Mm -hmm. So right now it goes to Dog River Library one day a month, Lithia Springs Library one day a month, and the courthouse uh, for, the last few, for the last few months. Um, we also have it uh, come to special events. And I know that uh, in the fall you had a job fair that we, we brought it out and we're able to bring it out to job fairs as well. We have a driver and a job coach that comes with this unit. Um, and the idea is to have al alternative access points for people who cannot get to a center, they can come to one of the libraries or wherever we're, we're at. The numbers on the mobile unit are actually increasing a little bit, so we're happy to see that. Um, and commissioners, one thing that, that we can certainly do is if we think that Dog River is not the right location, we can certainly move that location. If you think it's appropriate, we'll certainly take that under advisement. Um, the beauty is that it's on wheels. So if we have a parking space and a restroom, then we can go. Career services. So these are the people who actually enrolled for intensive services. You can see the numbers um, are actually going up a little bit last year. Um, what, we can, what we like to look at is, do they get a credential? So one of the things, if we send them to training, we want them to come out with a industry-recognized credential, a nationally industry-recognized credential. We also, of course, want them to get employed. Um, and then you can see the, the wages that they're earning on average for those that are getting employed. These numbers are low here because uh, when they entered in 2017, we're still working through and hopefully getting them. It, it takes um, oftentimes into the next year or so to actually finish that credential and get them employed. For youth, you can see uh, the numbers have been trending down a bit. Um, and then a positive exit here, these are the ones that have ended their service with us and have either um, got their GED, are back in school, or have gotten employment. So that's what we do for our job seekers. Um, for our businesses, uh, we have what's called work-based learning. But two primary areas where we provide services. One is on-the-job training. So if we have a company that needs a new employee, we can help connect them with a qualified person, put them in that business, and we will pay for a portion of their salary for up to six months while they're learning that job. The only guarantee we ask is that you, they'd be considered for full-time employment. Of course, we would like for them to stay on for full-time employment, uh, but if they don't work out, they don't work out. We all, they also have to start at $11.99 an hour or higher, um, and that is based on what is considered a living wage in, um, within the region. The other thing we offer is incumbent worker training. And these are companies that have existing employees and they need to do some internal training. A uh, good example is if you have a manufacturer, they get a new piece of equipment. Um, we can help pay for the training of existing employees to learn that new equipment. We'll pay for uh, half of that training cost for them to learn it. 
with the thought that at the end of that training cost, they will get a, uh, a pay increase and or a promotion. Currently, we are working with four companies in Douglas County. Um, Medline is really um, one of our stars. We have had 11 participants do on-the-job training, and we currently have 20 people going through incumbent worker training, so for an existing employees that are getting trained on a program. Um, and this is something that, when I end, I want to I want to ask you for your assistance. Is we would love to have more businesses in Douglas County taking advantage of these services. And if you could uh, indulge me for two minutes, um, play this quick video. This growing healthcare products company was preparing to hire and train more than 100 new employees at its Douglas County manufacturing plant. It was a task that loomed large for Medline Human Resources Manager Maurice Evans. He learned about WorkSource Atlanta Regional at a Douglasville Chamber of Commerce monthly luncheon. At the event, ARC staffer Lucius McReynolds discussed WIOA's training programs that are available to businesses of all sizes. Maurice was eager to learn more and invited Lucius to tour the facility and discuss the company's needs. Upon completing a program questionnaire, it became clear that WorkSource Atlanta Regional was a perfect solution to Medline staffing challenge. Today, Medline has received more than $30,000 to offset training initiatives. The savings realized through the company's partnership with WorkSource Atlanta Regional was recognized by Medline's division president, who was able to apply the cost savings for the creation of a new training manager position. Additionally, the funding provided through the WIOA program helped position the Human Resources Department as not just a cost center, but as a department that contributes to Medline's bottom line, both financially and through the improved performance of its managers and leaders. So each year we have an awards program, a recognition program, where we um, identify some, some uh, customers who have succeeded in our program over the past year. Um, and Medline was recognized last December as the business uh, customer um, and, and highlighted for their, their uh, support and engagement within, within the program. Um, so we have a, a video of all of the, I think we had nine different uh, honorees <coughs> this year, is up on our website. And I, of course, I just cut out this one piece to show you um, the, the, the Medline story. Um, so some thoughts I want to leave you with is, as I started, the workforce system is complicated. We know that. And, and we try to make it as easy as possible. But the reality is uh, our customers, the job seekers, businesses, can get confused about the system. Um, but we've got great staff who can help work with any customers uh, who are interested in engaging in our service and help them navigate through the system. Um, so ARC, as the administrative and fiscal agent for the Workforce Board, we provide a range of services for both job seekers and businesses for services geared directly for Douglas County residents and businesses. It is getting harder to reach job seekers. You saw the numbers of people are going down. Um, as, as I said, as the employment, unemployment rate goes down, it's a good story, but it's harder to go out and actually reach those people um, who have been long-term unemployed, who have been frustrated with the system, to get people engaged in the process. We have excellent services that are available at no cost to the business or the resident, um, and we would love to work with them uh, to help them um, meet their workforce needs. And we really need more businesses engaged in this program. As the number of job seekers go down, what we're finding is businesses are having a harder time filling their vacancies. So we need to gain, engage with those businesses and help them meet their needs. Uh, we're working with four Douglas County businesses right now. We would love to increase that. We have some dollars available. Um, and and uh, so my request to you is to work with your, um, your constituents and help us reach the job seekers help us reach the businesses that could benefit from the workforce services that we offer. So, Madam Chair, um, that is my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much, uh, Robert, for coming in today. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I've just, um, to your point, you talked about um, job seekers and business, you know, <coughs> wanting to grow. Um, and, and Metline ha happens to be obviously a, a, a good highlight and gem for us. Um, everybody's not part of the chamber, right? And everybody's not part of being incented by the De development authority here in Douglas County. Um, um, who then becomes the champion or the cheerleader to help bridge that gap for you? I mean, who? Uh, and I know you're presenting to us, but I'm right. just stating the obvious is that the, I mean, 
again, there's a gap. Um, yes, we have a lot of businesses on, at least on the east side, along with Medline, that can benefit from this, um, in, in my opinion. You know, in addition to the transportation that's getting people to those jobs, getting them to that, um, um, those business services, um, what is your approach? Are you working with Madam Chair directly to sort of close that gap? I mean, what is the point of the presentation beyond awareness to the public? Right. Um, and, and very good point because you're right. We have one person from a business standpoint who's assigned to work with Douglas County. Okay. And he works a lot with the Development Authority in the Chamber. Okay. Um, we've had a, a, a limitation on how we can market our services. It's actually a federal limitation on dollars. Um, but we have just hired a, a firm that's going to help us come up with a strategic outreach plan. And that's, there's a nuance there, but we're allowed to do that. So actually after this meeting, I'm meeting with that firm and they're going to help us come up with a better way to reach our customers. Um, that stays within the federal guidelines of no marketing dollars, but having outreach initiatives uh, where we can reach these people. Um, Getting to business penetration is difficult for us. And, and that's where I'm asking for your assistance because you work with the businesses, everybody in this room, you work with the residents, you work with the businesses. If you could help with the referrals to us, we would be, we would be glad to engage with them um, and, and, and get them more involved in our programs. So hopefully this outreach strategy will give us some actions we can, we can move forward with. But I'm also asking for assistance from anybody uh, who has those connections to, to help them um, connect back with us so that we could engage them in our services. And one, one of the things you talked about is um, getting people to those business opportunities, yes. right? The companies are, how do I fulfill my, my job openings? And that's one of the challenges we have here, getting people to those employment opportunities. Um, one of the things you talked about, MetLine, sometimes some of our companies are incentive. They can't fulfill their incentive plans because, right. again, uh, we love to hire locally, but people with cars can drive across the line and get those jobs. And so we recognize that there's a, a need to sort of strategize on that. But, you know, attrition is important, right? Um, turnover um, um, is important. Um, how do you, what is your success rate, though, in that, is there, and I saw your statistics, but I want you to just say it again, that uh, by bridging this gap, um, does it strengthen the community in essence? Does it make it better when you get, I mean, as it relates to the un unemployment rate? Oh, absolutely, yes. And we've been able to show, and I don't have the, the actual study with me, but we've been able to show that there's a uh, return on investment for workforce dollars of about three to one. Um, so, and, and that means we're getting people off of public assistance, and then we're also getting people working, so they're, they're paying into the tax, they're paying more taxes. Right. So there, there, is a, there is a direct financial correlation to people who go through intensive training, get a new skill, get employed, it is actually a, a, a very significant return on investment to the community. And you brought up a point, two of the biggest struggles we have for people who are engaging in the system are transportation and childcare. And it's a, it's a struggle for, for, for all workforce areas of how do we get people to the job and then how do we make sure that they could consistently go to their employment because they have uh, their childcare needs taken care of. So those are things where we try and partner with other organizations. We have some dollars to help um, some limited dollars to help while they're in training for transportation and child care, but we also try and connect them with other resources for long-term solutions. And the hope is when they get a job and start getting a paycheck, then they can start alleviating and, and addressing those needs more directly. All right, I, I thank you for the response, and, and now Chair, I yield back. Okay. Commissioner Guider? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LeBeau, is that? LeBeau. LeBeau? LeBeau. Yes, LeBeau. LeBeau. Okay. Well, we know that. Judge name Bo. <laughs> um, do y'all offer any like scholarships like to the uh, like West Georgia Tech to help pay for people to learn uh, certain skills? Yes. Or like CCI, you know they they're going to school then. But you don't offer anything to the people that's already in school that's going to be graduating. What, what we offer, so if, if, a, if a person qualifies for our training dollars, um, and there's a, a whole series of, of, of qualification standards they need to go through, um, we can pay, right, the dollars are actually going to go up, so as of July 1st, we can pay up to $7,000 for a one-year program and up to $10,000 for a two-year program for them to attend a qualified, um, technical school. it could be a technical school, it could be a private provider, it could be a nonprofit, 
Um, so we have a list, there's a statewide list of all these qualified uh, training programs. And as long as they qualify for our services, they are then eligible to receive, um, as I said, up to $7,000 for a year and up to $10,000 for a two-year program. Oftentimes, our technical colleges are one of the, the, the biggest um, recipients of those dollars that we provide. So yes, they do qualify. If they qualify, they can use them for a qualified program at uh, the technical college here. Well, um, it sounds like a great plan. Yes. The only thing is I didn't know anything about it, and, <laughs> and you didn't either. So, great. Uh, we can't get the word out if we don't know anything about it. Absolutely. So I'll be glad to uh, help in District 4. And Dog River, uh, you mentioned Dog River, it is a more rural yes. area. But, um, and most of the time people uh, that live in the rural area are the ones that do have the cars because they, <coughs> they don't walk to the store and stuff like that. Right. But um, also here in Douglas County we have accountability courts. And I just wonder, uh, have you ever thought about uh, working with the judges? Because one of the requirements is that they have a job and they may have messed up somewhere. Maybe it, it could be a uh, misdemeanor or uh, felony. Right. Really. But they're in a court and they're being supervised and everything. Do you ever work with them as far as uh, providing some training for uh, people in the accountability courts? Right. We, we do have, I don't know if, if y'all, if we're working directly with the accountability courts. Um, I don't think it's directly, but we have with the groups that come in right that population, that population. yes so and, and as an example seven, uh, if they qualify yes. if they qualify mm -hmm. uh if they have a record does that disqualify them oh no absolutely not actually that makes them more qualified oh really <laughs> yes what do the judges know about you that's a, a question I, i'm not sure how much they know well we have uh we have about three or four accountability courts right here right. in douglas county and they would love to talk to you absolutely. i assure you uh, so we can set you up <laughs> that, would be that great. conversation because uh, they do require that the participants uh, work. And but let me mention just on that a, a quick note. We have a, a unique program we're running with Gwinnett Corrections right now. Um, for, for people who are currently incarcerated, as they're getting ready to be released, yeah. we have a, a program at the correctional facility where we will get them into a... Um, a uh, forklift operator program. And so before they're released, they go through this training, they actually get a national certification as a forklift op operator, and they also get interviewing skills and how to write a resume. And then they're released and they have this credential and they can go out and hopefully get a job at that point. That's a program we're working in Gwinnett. We would certainly love to consider that in yes. other locations as well. And have you ever spoken at our um, chamber of commerce here? Yes, we've spoken with both the chamber and the development authority. Um, okay. Yes. And we would be glad to come back and, and, and talk with them again. Uh, I'd like uh, some brochures or something Absolutely. Uh, that have the addresses and everything. On. This should be at your place. Um, and I it, do a newsletter, it, it, so it, It's an overview of, of the services, and then all of the addresses are on the back, including the ones that are outside of our jurisdiction, so the ones in the city of Atlanta and Fulton County, because we know that sometimes it's easier for them to, for residents and, and, and uh, businesses to to work there, they can start there, and then they can get referred to the correct place. But there should be a, at your place. Well, we, we need to get the word out to some of the businesses. I don't think absolutely. the businesses know about it. Um, Not enough of them know about it. You're, yeah. you're absolutely correct. And uh, so anyway, I, I look forward to working with y'all. Great. And the other thing we can offer for businesses is we do recruitment um, at our location. So if, if they've got 50 jobs they're trying to fill and they want to come in one day and have a recruitment day, um, and we'd also um, be willing to come to this location if you wanted, or another location, because our, our, the site we're using is small. Um, and unfortunately, um, it's, it's not big enough where we got multiple things going on at one time. So if, we, if we're doing testing for our, our customers, we have to close it down so we can do testing. Um, but if there's a site, if you wanted to have a business come here or another um, location, we can help do a recruitment session and have um, some job seekers actually come to another location and we can, uh, we, we can help them, uh, you know, hopefully meet with, with the business either at another location or at the, uh, the, the location on Club Drive. Well, uh, I deal with a program uh, at my church that uh, we do work, we, we work with um, people that's gotten in trouble maybe mm -hmm. and the courts refer right. to us and everything and, and 
a lot of times uh, mothers can't get their children back because they can't get a job. Right. And those are the people that um, <clears throat> could really use a program like this. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be a great connection. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you back. Commissioner Mulkey. Yeah, I suppose then you uh, I, I would uh, suggest uh, at least investigate a very low-tech approach, okay. at least as, as part of your strategy, and that would be to look at local one ads for people hiring uh, and have someone on staff uh, contact the hiring entity, the company, right. uh, and if they're not interested in the program, you at least get information to them so that they know about it in the future. Or you might actually engage them actively to, to follow up and assist them with their with their job search, find out what their needs and requirements are. Great. Uh, but just just go to the one ads, the employment ads. Absolutely. And, 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 yeah, call, and call and call these people. Right. I yield back. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Just, just a few and, and, and good conversations, so I must say though, but and I may have missed this. You, you guys work closely with the Department of Labor, correct? Yes. So um, there's this logo. WorkSource Georgia is a new branding that the state came out with where all of the organizations that are involved in workforce development are, are working together. Department of Labor, okay. technical college system, vocational rehab, we're all in a, in a cooperative approach to try and work together um, on, on workforce development. Okay. Good, good, good. That's good to know. And, and, and you talked about uh, for those who, you know, just trying to get their GED to uh, some post and secondary type of education and so on and so forth. How do you, I mean, the short story, because I know that there's all types of different qualifications, and I'm glad to know that right. that you guys look, you know, definitely at those that have been incarcerated, that, that have a, a real huge struggle in trying to get back into the workforce, that you guys give them a serious look yes. and hope that those employers do the same. Right. So what, what's the small story and, and the qualifications that he or she may may need to kind of even be a part of your sure. program? Sure. Yeah. And, and, of course, Staff can help me if I get it wrong. First of all, if you're unemployed, if, if you have been laid off, mm -hmm. basically if you're getting unemployment insurance, we can work with you. It doesn't matter what your income was. You could you could have been a CEO making three hundred thousand, or you could have been you know making five dollars an hour or seven dollars an hour. We can work with you. <coughs> so if you've been recently laid off, mm -hmm. um, outside of that, it's typically a a financial consideration. So a family income of whatever the the, the poverty rate has been set for certain areas by the Department of Labor. Um, so if they qualify for that, then we can work with them. Mm -hmm. um, that's, ba that's basically the two primary. That's correct. And anyone who um, is receiving like public assistance, food stamps or anything like that, that's like an automatic qualifier because they've already been through the process with the Family Department of Family and Children Services mm -hmm. to receive those um, those that support. So we'll be able to pick them up as well. Right. And then with also, the, then with they're just unemployed. Unemployed. The they're filling out the application. Right. And for those who just want to make a change in career, they all of a sudden decide they want to go and do something else, be a forklift driver now, versus right. being a CEO of a major company. Yeah, that would depend on if they are suitable and they're still marketable. So for example, if they come in and they have the just recently lost their job, mm -hmm. or they want, they're wanting to change careers, mm -hmm. then at that point we would look at them and see if they're still marketable and we would try to bridge them with um, an employer who's seeking that, that um, actual training. Yeah. And so we generally, if they've been out of school for at least two years, then we would look at that as well. So, yeah. and, I, and I will say just, uh, as I said at the beginning, anybody can come into the center yeah. and do some basic job search, talk with somebody. It's, it's getting into the intensive services where, where we actually provide dollars to do you know, the retraining component. Those are, right. that's where we start getting into our right. qualification needs. And, and, and that's what you talked about, those federal dollars or and or state dollars, or exactly the federal, state, and whatever else. That's when you kind of have to control that part of it. Exactly. As to what you can and can't do, trying to retrain and or yes. educate someone. Yes. Okay. And uh, my other question is in reference to the mobile unit that uh, makes its, its rounds. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a couple of stops. Right. Is there certain days of the week, or is it just kind of yes. you know how you feel that morning? Or <laughs> no. we, we have a standard calendar okay. which we publish on our website and and at whatever location we're going to. Um, and I believe for for Douglas, it is pretty much the same day every month. Yes, um, Thursdays. Thursdays. Yeah. So one Thursday it's at Dog River, another Thursday it's at Lithia Springs, and then another Thursday 
Is it a Thursday that where's, it comes to the courthouse? Where's that schedule posted? Where's that schedule, right. you know, kind of displayed so those that may be watching today right. could actually know where to go and kind of say, I right. know where to go and get it's, this. It's on our website and it's also at the libraries and it's at the center on, uh, on Club Drive. And it speaks of the, the, not only the location, but the times in which yes. the mobile unit will be there, right. how long, and yes. all that kind it's, of stuff. It's just a simple calendar that have all the locations of where the mobile unit will be at any given time. Mm -hmm. So you can go on the website and look at that. And we're also trying to do more social media mm -hmm. because that's the prevalence right, right now in this right. day and age. Mm -hmm. And so we're not quite there yet, but you know we can encourage everyone to go to the website, to the um, on the workforce and economy website. Oh, that which, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. But for those of us who are not savvy with the technology side of things and the websites, for those right. that are just strictly you know just paper and facts. Right. How are you guys trying to market or get to those guys? I mean, not just the employer, but those that might looking for future employment. So, I, I mean, I was getting a nod from our program director over here that this is probably something we definitely need to put on. Uh, yes. On, on our on uh, TV twenty three. Maybe if Phyllis was interviewed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Sometime last year with yes. that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, real, real quick, point of, order, point of order, we, we're filming this, and these are some great conversations to my, my colleague, Kim. You guys speak who are adding to the conversation to the podium, or if you can ask our speaker to repeat the answers, because I don't want this to get lost. Yeah. I mean, we are filming this for our citizens, so yes. I res if you Mitchell, yeah. I res if, if you If you go to the podium, then at least we can kind of share your... Sure. Rick Martin, uh, Director of Communications for Douglas County. Uh, I joined... Um, Douglas County in this capacity uh, last fall, September to be specific, uh, September. And when I joined, uh, we had recently uh, done a story uh, interviewing um, the uh, uh, workforce development and uh, we discussed the particulars, the schedule. Uh, there was a story written on CelebrateDouglasCounty.com. Uh, the uh, bus came out uh, for September Saturdays, uh, publicity was done, promoted, and schedule was given. So we have uh, provided that information to the public, but with the presentation today, it's a great opportunity to reignite uh, you know, the information as well to uh, help you know, inform the public of its availability. Because I, I just, you know, I just want to make sure that we take all angles that we can, can possibly take to include with the Sentinel, the neighbor, and everybody else. Hopefully, they're kind of, uh, kind of looking into this whole makeup as to how those that are looking for employment and can even up or change their employment and so on and so forth. So I think it's good. Uh, outside of that, thank you guys. I really thank appreciate you. this, and I think this is a, a wonderful, you know, thought process. So thank you again. And I will mention from yes. the from the web presence, um, it's atlantaregional.org. That's the main page, and then you'll see that there'll be a button for workforce, mm -hmm. and then you can get all the information and the calendars and the schedules and so forth yes. um, on that site. I yield back then. I have a question. Oh. Here. Uh. I, I just had a question. I'm Jenny McVeigh with Juvenile Programs Administration. Um, I was wondering, is it possible for the bus to go to the defects office? So um, we can look at that. We have a very, very full schedule with the bus. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll ask Phyllis to, to look at the schedule and, and determine if there's a, a opportunity to go there. Um, as a special event, we can usually work it in a day. As a, as a regular ongoing um, stop, that would be more difficult um, just because it is pretty pretty full on a regular basis. But for special events, we can, we can typically work in work well, a day. And the reason that I suggest that is because all, uh, a lot of the lower income families go to the department to, to get benefits. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. seems yeah. to me to be a very logical location mm -hmm. for them yes. you know, to go down there. And also to the public housing mm -hmm. projects that we have right. in our community. If they don't have a way to get to the courthouse or somewhere else, then it's not beneficial for them. And what we've done in the past is we can try a special event at a location, and if that turns out well, then we can work with, with, um, with you all to determine whether we would <laughs> shift it from one of the libraries to that location on, you know, on, on some type of a rotating, uh, rotating schedule. But, but you did say that, that that's kind of, you have a true schedule, but is that schedule 
a little bit flexible, or is it is it carved in stone? That's kind of what it is, and where you guys go, and that's just kind of what you got. Oh, so. if, if it was a decision was made working with, with you and working with our staff that say um, Dog River wasn't working out, and we wanted to move from Dog River and go to the Juvenile Justice Center, we can right. make that as a as a, a permanent change. Understood. But we want to make sure the numbers. Okay, it's got to make sense. Um, I mean, but we do go to all seven of our counties, so that's why it, it's it's hard to add in a regular stop without impacting um, another no, county location. Okay. I, I know that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McDade kind of anticipated my question to, to a degree, and it has to do with the with the bus location. The bus. Uh, uh, it would seem to me uh, to reach your your target areas, you need. You need to go where they always go, and that's, that's shopping. So, do you have a prohibition on having to use uh, government or county county entity properties, or can you go to shopping areas? Because I think that's where you will reach more uh, more customers. Right. We, we we are not limited on on going to the private property, but the property owner has to Certainly. invite us, give us a space, and then. The mobile unit doesn't have a restroom, and since we're there for multiple hours, we need to have access to a public restroom for both our customers and the staff that are on the bus. Sure. Those are the two primary limitations. Are there others, Phyllis, that we No, that's pretty much it, and we've um, reached out in Gwinnett, of course, to a shopping center, and we were not allowed to, to go there. Okay, I think Douglas County uh, businesses can work with you. I just, I, okay. I, que I question the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of, of uh, going to libraries. Mm -hmm just because of the uh, throughput of people. Right. Mm -hmm. And it might be something we could look at. It might be a, not a question of scheduling a new place, but perhaps replacing a place. Mm -hmm. I, I yield back. Okay. Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? I just have one comment, Rob. How long have you all been here? The reason why I asked you to come today was so we could raise the profile sure. of work of force development in Douglas County. So you, how long have you existed in Douglas County? Um, well, at least 30 years, right? Yeah, at least 30 years. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, well, we're definitely going to raise the profile. <laughs> Another question I have for you is, you mentioned when we met, um, and I'm so glad and thankful for the meeting we had, you talked about Department of Labor for yes. those who have this unemployed that need to uh, file their unemployment benefits. Have we had any uh, discussions with the Department of Labor to have someone come to Douglas County right. once, uh, I think you said once a week or? Well, we have an office where we could offer them to sit at the Club Drive. We have uh, contact to Department of Labor. We have not yet worked out the details. Um, Department of Labor is in a bit of transition at this time. They're actually closing more of their sites. They're laying off people. So we are trying to work with them, and we want to get them to, to have a, uh, a regular time that they would come to this location, but we've not gotten to that agreement yet. We will continue that conversation and certainly uh, hopefully report back to you of, of, of a positive outcome. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the board? Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Good stuff. Good conversation. Next, we have a presentation by Terminus uh, Municipal Advisors regarding the county's financial overview, strategic planning model, and uh, recommended policies. Uh, Jennifer Hallman, I, you'll introduce everyone. Of course. Sure. Um, Terminus is here with us today. Um, Matthew Arrington and David Corbin, they're passing out um, documents um, that they will be discussing. Of course, the book is a lot thicker. We're not going to go through the whole book today. We're just going to have some highlights, executive summary that you'll see also uh, given to you. Uh, we've been working on um, just the financial overview about where Douglas County was, where we are, where we need to be, where we're going. Um, so a lot of this book is that, as well as some um, a recommended policy in which they'll go in the detail of the recommended policy when we went to New York. Uh, to visit the rating agencies, um, they asked about anything above a certain level of our fund balance policy. Um, do we have a plan in place on how that money is spent? Um, at the time we did not, it was just pretty much a, a topic of discussion like for the animal shelter, the finance committee made a recommendation, it was brought before the board, so it's all transparent, but there's just no, there was no formal policy developed. So that was also something that Terminus uh, um, will be presenting today um, is a draft policy. It's not something that we're asking to adopt at this meeting or tomorrow's meeting, but um, definitely would like your um, input in it as well as um, 
any recommendations so when we do bring it back before y'all for approval we'll be ready to go so saying all that uh, we'll also be um, touching on a little bit of the planning model uh, the, or the financial tool that um, was developed in helping us uh, forecast um, because that has a lot more interactive and we'll be using the mondo pad uh, for that we'll be doing that i believe after the executive session um, and just go over the highlights um, right now of their project that they were um, asked to do. <coughs> they came in November of last year to give just a update of where they're at, and this is a completion um, presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Matthew Aarons with Terminus Municipal Advisors. I also have David Corbin here with me. Uh, like Jennifer said, we've been working on this project uh, for a couple of months. You have a large book in front of you, and we definitely will not go through that. Uh, contains a lot of information, uh, historical information on your financials for about the past eight, nine years, as well as comparisons to other counties. And uh, what we want to focus on this morning is kind of section six of that book, which is uh, printed out separately here as a summary. Uh, as Jennifer talked about, uh, the financial policy is what we want to jump into first, and Dave will kind of go over some of the numbers. Uh, one good thing I just want to note is we reviewed your financial policies, and truth be told, we found everything to kind of be great. Um, you know, for a AA2 rated county. There were just a few things we decided to nitpick at. Same thing the rating agencies did. I mean, they, they rated you AA2, they gave your management and staff and the governance all high marks, and they just said, look, if you could do anything, here's something to look at. So that's what we want to look at here. There are really three particular policies that I'll, I'll kind of go to, and the last one I'll spend a little more time on. But the first one, uh, which it says page 54 in this handout here, but the uh, first one is basically, um, you do not have a separate, what we call capital fund. You guys have always been using SPLOS to kind of come to your capital projects. So what we recommend is you guys set up what we call a capital fund. And the financial model will show you how that money flows and, and how, how, how do we fund this is going to be the last thing. So the, the, last, the last page is what Jennifer was talking about. And that policy describes what do you do with excess fund balance. So let's just say you guys have you know, a particular budget and you guys end up with an additional $14 million of cash. What do you do with that? Well, uh, the policy basically states that you create what I've talked about earlier, the capital fund, and we will take at least 50% of that. It will be up to you to set the goal level, but we would say at least 50% of that goes to a capital fund. And then we just have some framework of a policy that talks about what it could be used for, um, you know, what you go in for. So basically you could use it to finance any construction, reconstruction, or acquisition of capital improvements uh, for future tax levy stabilization to pay existing debt or anything that the county declares as an emergency. Uh, so you need to work with your attorney and kind of craft it and draft it the way you want to. Right now your fund balance goal is 10% um, of what your, your, balance, your budget is. We think at some point you probably want to try to get more to 15%. Right now, 10% is 45 days cash, and you're, you're at that. That's fine. That's what most counties are. I've got some count, uh, counties that are uh, below that. But right now, 45 days is great. If you were to do 15%, uh, that's going to probably bump you up to about 60 to 75 days uh, operating cash. So what we're saying is once you get to that 15%, then we would start putting money into this fund that you would set aside. And again, what it would do is, you know, one day, God forbid, if, if supplies <coughs> ever passed, you now have a bucket of money you can go to for projects and things of that nature. Uh, think about the two years ago, you decided to take some money and uh, do the animal shelter, which was fine. Uh, but there was just no policy that guided you to say why you would do that. So uh, with that being said, those are really the only financial policies that we saw. Um, David is going to talk a little bit about the numbers and some of the other things. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning. Let me mention another right. trigger that goes along with that fund balance policy or what we're talking about uh, is the development of a capital improvement plan. Part of what we've done over the last 90 days or so is look at, sort of look at everything financial that, that's going on in the county over the last nine years. <coughs> we had to go back and look at your historical financial information. We've looked at your SPLOS program. What's really missing is you can put a policy together that says we're going to put so much money away for capital projects, but you don't have a capital improvement plan. So we're encouraging you as a part of that process to develop a capital improvement plan that will then support the policy that, you're, you, know, that you want to create. With regard to the financials that Matthew spoke about, 
earlier. Again, we went back nine years, we've looked at everything. The reality of it is you've got about a margin of about 5%. So if you bring in $10, you're going to spend all but 5% of that, right, on, on expenditures. I mean, historically and statistically speaking, that's what it works out to be. 80% of your revenue comes from primarily two sources, property taxes and local sales taxes. And of that 80%, you only control really one of them, which is the property tax. Mm -hmm. So part of what we've tried to do, and we'll get into it a little later, I think, with the financial model, is to develop a model that provides a tool for you and the county to be able to utilize, project, plan, uh, but it's heavily weighted toward the expenditure side of your platform, not so much the revenue side. There have been some comments earlier uh, in terms of development of this model with regard to the regression analysis, statistical planning. We try to incorporate as much of those moving parts, but at the end of the day, we've got to make it simplistic enough for you to, for you to, for you to utilize this tool on a daily basis. You don't have that many moving parts on the revenue side. You have property taxes, which are sort of the buffer that gets you from A to Z. You've got 100 moving parts on the expense side. And I think the, the more that we can plan and lay out what that model looks like and put the thought process into it, the better off you'll be. So we've given you a lot of information. I think the model that we've presented is a culmination of all of that. And the policies that we're recommending have to be done. They're all coordinated. So I wouldn't recommend the fund balance policy without telling you you need a capital improvement plan and you need a thoughtful process for which to, to make decisions going forward. We're available for any questions, any details you want to go through. A lot of information here. We can go through numbers all day, but. Will you maybe just highlight the revenue history and touch on a little bit on the revenues and the expenditures like you did back in November, I think? Uh, as Matthew had indicated earlier, we uh, went back again to 2009. Um, what you've had over, you know, even with the recession since 2009, again, you've got about a 5%. You know what page they're referring to? What book did you get yes. for books? No, they have this book. They have this book. There, again, when I go back, I'm going to talk about the margins. Um, since 2009, again, no matter how much the county is, the revenue in the county is raised, you spend 95% of it. I mean, that's the most important item. The margins are really... Like 17. Yep. Well, I don't have that, but that's okay. How we do? This is it. Yeah, so, you know, I think if you go to page 11, is that what you're on, John? 17 or 11. Yes. Yeah, okay. Different buys with different page numbers. Uh, so you can go back, if you look at this chart, you can see whether, you know, in 2009, you had total revenues of 76 million and approximately 77 million in 2016. Uh, you still, no matter what the margin is, the average margin has been about 5%. You're spending most of what you bring in. That's, that's, I mean, I can go through individual line items, but that's the gist of where you are. There's not a lot of cushion. I know a lot of times people think there's a lot of cushion that you're, but there's not. You know, your expenditures are fairly predictable. So again, what, what moves that needle is whether you spend more or less are really things that pop up that you decide you're going to spend money for that or you didn't account for. Everything that we're trying to do going forward is to at least think about how to set up a process and a framework to deal with those unexpected um, those ex unexpected uh, expenditures or initiatives that you want to do that maybe two to three years out. Okay. Um, I just had one comment. A lot of our performances, they also the, should I say that safety net also has been related to grants. And uh, thank God we've had those in the past, sure. and uh, some of our uh, businesses, or should I say, some of our operations are funded by grants. So <coughs> if we didn't have those, we wouldn't even have that five percent margin. That, that, that's correct. So that's correct. Yes, that is very correct. So, with that being said, I have just one question. As we go forward, um, particularly as we have some new 
companies coming on such as Switch and T5. What do you, will that 5% margin change, particularly because it's related to property taxes? Would could you talk about that a little bit? You so, so you're, let me make sure I'm clear. Are you asking that the more money you make, the more you'll keep? <laughs> yeah, I'm just asking you if you can, yeah. did you, did you kind of stretch it out? Have you forecasted what it will look like, that 5%? Will it, will it uh, change to maybe perhaps 10% margin, 15 What have you forecasted? So, in none of our forecasts, and, and the forecast is, again, because I have a fellow economist in the room, so I'll be very, very careful about forecasting, but uh, what, we, what we've looked at is, even with 5% growth, mm -hmm. it still goes back to how much you spend. It's not how much you make, it's how much, how much you spend. <coughs> so what we don't know is how much you're planning on spending. So we've estimated out, as you'll see in the model later on today, we've used various 2%, 3% growth <coughs> estimates that mirror what we think is going on with, it, with the general economy, pay raises, cost of living adjustments, health care. All those factors are being taken into consideration. And at the end of the day, it's still about 5%, right? So it's, that's a very difficult question because it's an expense-driven question, not a revenue question. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Guido? Yes. yes um, you set up a capital uh, improvement um, account. What would keep you from dipping into it? <laughs> well, you know, again, I think part of the, pro the, the proposed policy statement that we've outlined in here, one, one requirement that we would, we would submit to you is it should have been placed on the capital improvement program, right? So if it's not on the CIP list, then, you know, certainly I, don't, I wouldn't say don't consider it, but at a minimum it needs to be on some master approved capital improvement list that this board well, we have a capital improvement plan for the roads that we used a lot of it this year for the budget process. So, if we're if we're gonna if we know it's there, what's gonna prevent us from using it up? Well, it's just a matter. At the end of the day, it's a decision that you know it doesn't it doesn't remove. We can't mandate that we <laughs> no, we well, can't use it. I guess. <laughs> right. You can't mandate that you don't you don't use it. The, the, the important thing about the capital improvement plan, and why we stress that plan, is not only is it the initial. What what always concerns me as a former finance officer is making a capital investment, but not acknowledging that there are residual costs that you're, going to, that you're going to have going forward for the next 10 or 15 years. And so part of that process is an evaluation process that says if we're going to buy something or if we're going to invest in some infrastructure, is there an associated carry cost with it in perpetuity? Mm -hmm. And that's the part of So what we want to do is make sure that when you do make the decision to spend the money, that you at least have those tools in your hand or a process by which that project went through, so you can evaluate it appropriately. Well, you mentioned the two uh, main sources of revenue as property tax and, and sales tax. Now, if it's a splash, that's one thing, but a sales tax, local option sales tax is used as a rollback on property tax, so we don't get to spend that money, right? Do we roll the whole thing back, or just a portion? It's part of a rollback, yes. Is it the whole thing? Mm -hmm. um, yes, ma'am. So we're required by law to roll back property tax for the local option sales tax that we have here. Right. So that really that's not revenue that we can count on spending, right? Am I wrong? It is. It's just a different bucket. Yeah. Just the but it's used to roll back on the property tax. Right. So. Uh, yeah, so I don't see that we get to spend that as much, well, it as, gets, uh, it's, unless it's a splash. Now, if it's a uh, special local option sales tax, that's one thing. You get to keep all of that. You do spend <laughs> the local option sales tax in your general fund. Like I said, you get about 80% of the 80 million or so revenues that you have on an annual basis. 80% of that comes from property taxes and local option sales taxes, local option taxes. So you do spend it in your general fund. I guess what I'm saying is the local option sales tax we have to use as a rollback on property taxes. We, we give it back to the citizens. You get the, 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 in a way. 
I, I know we, our property taxes would be higher if we didn't have the local option sales But tax. we're required by law to apply it to, right? As if, you, if you roll back. If, 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 yeah. But what but, but <clears throat> I think they're saying, you're still getting the growth. It's not dollar for dollar. No. That's what right. David's talking about. It's not dollar for dollar. If you roll back the first bucket you're rolling back from is the local option sales tax and shrinking it, if I'm not mistaken. But it's not dollar for dollar. Well, it, it reverts. I think it is. It, it reverts back to the, again, when we get to the fiscal model, you will find that everything reverts back to, unfortunately, good or bad, the property tax. Mm -hmm. You don't have 20 streams of revenue. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the property tax accounts for, for about 48% of your overall revenue, my guess is, I mean, again, depending on spending, that's the only number that's going to either go higher or go lower. More than likely, it's going to go higher because of part of what you said. If you do better in sales, in, in, the, in the, with the, the, the taxes, we roll back more. You roll back more. Uh, but if we don't do good in sales tax, then the taxpayers are paying higher taxes. That's because that's the only <laughs> other that's the only other revenue source that you actually have to work with. That's the and the model well is heavily reliant on. The other parts really aren't going to move. So permitting, licensing, those fees account for about 20% of the county's overall <coughs> revenue profile. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're static. And they're, even if you double the fee, you won't, you won't see double it show up materially in your revenue profile. So it really goes back to managing what you spend. What you spend. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, I get that. Okay, Commissioner Yeah. Um, just bring a little clarity that the term required uh, has been used around the room uh, several times. We are not required to roll back uh, property taxes when we have a uh, an increase in sales taxes. We elect to do that, and that's what we're charged with as commissioners. No, 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 no. no you're, you're getting them mixed up. No, I'm talking about I'm talking about the rollback. That's the uh, the tax right. rollback. Otherwise, it's that's a tax it's a tax increase on the there's, growth. There's two types <laughs> of rollbacks. There's a local option sales tax rollback mm -hmm. that is required. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Okay. Then the rollback you're referring to that, that you don't have to roll back if the growth is, is the growth. Well, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I'm assessment. talking about. But it, the, 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 to me, there wasn't clarity with doing one type of uh, tax collection and the other type, type of tax collection. We do have the option of not rolling back our, reg, our regular, if you call it sales tax, I call it a regular sales tax. But we, but we elect we elect to do that. Reassessment growth. Yeah, right. Reassessment right. growth. Right. Yes. It, it, exactly. So. Uh, it all comes back to uh, the policy. You know, we're, we're sitting here and, and talking about, you know, is it going to be done? Will we do it? Or will we have the discipline? And that's what it comes to is, is the discipline of, in that, first of all, enacting a policy and then sticking to it. Uh, the problem is, of course, you have, you have changes in, in, in leadership in the county, commissioners coming and going, so it, it takes an ongoing, it takes an ongoing commitment, basically a core philosophy for the county to first of all uh, adopt, adopt the policy and then stick to it over 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years. And that's what it's all about. Uh, I'm strongly committed to the uh, uh, the idea of a capital fund. It will answer a lot of our problems and, and a lot of the questions that we have when, when we come to paying for things for spots. If we, if we maintain, create and maintain a, a capital fund, we don't have to rely on spots. The balancing act becomes when the citizens have a rightful expectation that they not be overtaxed. And so the challenge becomes how do you build this, this fund and say well, we're not going we're not going to lower the taxes or whatever the mechanism that we use to create this fund so that down down the road five or ten years, you know, we can pay for a, fire, a million dollar fire truck uh, without splotched. And I think that's what everybody, long term, I think a lot of people would like to see a uh, penny, uh, you know, splotched tax go away. So it comes, it comes down to number one, policy, and, and number two, the discipline to carry it through the, to carry it through the decades. Uh, the good news is, I, I never hesitate to bring this up, is that this, this administration in the, in the past has done a good job. <coughs> 
of rebalancing our tax digest considerably away from homeowner property owners to the to the commercial side. I don't, I don't have the numbers of, you know, current or fresh in my memory, uh, but there's been a significant shift uh, away from residential uh, percentage to the, to the commercial, non-commercial uh, percentage in our tax digest. And that's going to continue, and it's going to continue to be more robust as we have things like SWISH uh, and T5 and these data centers coming in. So that's going to be a boom. That's largely, I think, where our ability to create a capital fund will come from, and not on uh, home uh, residential property owners. Right, so, bottom line, policy and discipline. Right. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Mr. Wolf here said everything I was going to say. So I, 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 I can keep, keep this tight. Um, it, 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 it was all about discipline. We all, um, Ken Bernard and Jennifer and all of us, Madam Chair, went to New York. Um, to his opening comments, it was like you're good, but, but get better. Right, get better. And here's an opportunity. And so we, we, we purpose coming back on in, in, that, in that snowstorm, getting ahead, to, to sort of um, you know, acknowledge the fact that we could get better. Um, in this area, it, it, Commissioner Mulligan's point, it, it has been a cons consistent thread through um, finance here in this county. Uh, contrary to, to opinion, like, no, we've done a very good job in managing a nickel. A very good job. But going forward, how do we balance that? Right? Um, how, how do we, now, to Commissioner Mulligan's point, when you have a different priority set, right? And it begins to shift. It's an ebb and flow with anything in life, right? It just becomes priorities. But you still only have a nickel, right? You, and with that nickel, you can throw this thing off very quickly. But that's just a matter of, well, it becomes priorities. As opposed to doing this, we're doing that. As opposed to doing that, we're doing this. Those are discretions of the Board of Commissioners. But I think I appreciate um, Director Hallman for sort of taking this on and, and working with um, our consultants to put this in place. Because to Commissioner Walker's point, the commissioners are not going to always be here. But, but the bureaucracy, that the staff will, right? So just because I understand forecasting and feasibility and teach it all day long, it, I'm going to be gone, all right? So it's important to get that institutionalized and become a policy here within so that it lives on beyond just us. That's what's key. That was his whole point is that you do a great job. Yes, you had the discretion to go with the animal shelter. Yeah, just go ahead and spend five million cash. It was a good decision, but it's like you have nothing codified. It's about codifying policy. <coughs> I think for us, um, steady. You know, uh, I mean, this book is great. This is this is a, this is some good stuff, guys. If y'all get a copy of it, if you get it, it's it's it'll tell you everything you need to know. Uh, but I'm interested in the tool. I won't belabor this moment. I think we're going to um, Commissioner Mulk here. You brought this up in your request on um, beyond policy is making sure we had a solid tool that we can use. And so I think we're going to see this Jennifer afterwards later on today. Yes, sir. All right, then I'm going to yield further questions to the end, Madam Chair, until we get to the tool. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from board commissioners? One quick, quick, quick okay. question. That's fine. Uh, will, will this information be available? How will it be available to the public? I can get the, you'll probably send me an Adobe file. Per, mm -hmm. I would say probably robustly, probably the whole thing, but in terms of maybe the website, maybe, maybe the executive uh, summary mm -hmm. and, and historical. At least people can look at that in their We'll, we'll provide you with all the bulk yeah. information that you can mm -hmm. yeah. determine how you want to distribute it. Okay, sure. Okay. It, it would be how better, uh, Madam Chair, it would be better if there's a way to put this on, on the website because the open records clerk will be driven yeah. nuts yeah. trying to copy yeah. this. Yeah. So if you can make it available for the public, it might be the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Jennifer, you? Yes, yes, we'll get it on our website. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for a great presentation. Great job. Thank you. Great job. Next, you have the approval approval of the minutes. Uh, just ask us to take a look at those, and we will uh, approve them tomorrow. So please make sure you review the minutes. Um, County Administrator, do you have any new business today? No, ma'am. Okay. And we have uh, 10 business items. Tab number four, authorization to apply for a grant from the CJCC Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for the misdemeanor uh, minor, uh, DUI drug court in the amount of $70,000 to $90,000 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, Ms. Anita Granger, good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good morning. Good. Good to see you all. 
Um, so this is just the preliminary. Um, I'm asking permission to apply for the grant, which I apparently haven't done in the past year or so. I'm trying to get on board with what the policy is. Um, there's nothing that you need to sign on the application, Commissioner. Um, what I will need to do is get this back on the agenda either late May or early June for the acceptance of the funds that are awarded, should there be any. But I will be filling out that application is due on March 23rd, um, and I am working on that application now. It's very um, lengthy, so um, I will be asking somewhere in the neighborhood of seventy to 90000 I may, I may ask for more than that. Last year we got a little under 80000 so... Um, I'll try to keep that um, as steady as I can. Okay. Thank you so much. Any questions from the board of commissioners? Commissioner Mitchell. Is, is there a match or anything? Or I'm there is. This is a. This is where the one where they say it's a 10% match, but it's really one ninth. Remember last year when I came up and I said the match is this much. Mm -hmm. or it's 10%, but it doesn't work out the math that way. So what they do is they take the base of what you get awarded, mm -hmm. divide it by nine, and that's your mm -hmm. match. Um, we use my salary because that is in the um, the grant does not cover any of my salary at all. The um, county covers that in the general fund, so mm -hmm. we use my salary for the match. Okay, gotcha. I'll allow you that. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the board? Thank you so much, Mrs. Thank Green. you. See you in May. Tab number five. <laughs> <laughs> Tab number five, authorization to renew an agreement with Willowbrook for services provided to the Felony Drug Court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final review. Um, Tim Pruitt, he's not here today. Okay, so we'll move on. Oh, is it a Oh, I, yeah, um, I thought maybe I, would, I could talk on Tim. I can't really talk on Tim's. Um, contract with Willowbrook because I don't know anything about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> up here. Good. Uh, but I can text him to see if he's coming this morning if you'd like. Okay. 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 We'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just keep moving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tab, tab number six, authorization for the chairman to execute an employment agreement with Erica Marchand as guardian uh, aid Lydia. Um, Mrs. McDade, how are you today? Um, this is just a replacement for um, an employee that um, changed positions from mm -hmm. my office to the DA's office. Okay. Any questions of guardian ad litem position? Commissioner Robinson. What's a guardian ad litem? I mean, guardian what is that? I mean, yeah. Guardian ad litem is somebody that's appointed to a child or multiple children in a deprivation case. And their job is to make sure that the interests of the children are being um, supported um, by the court and all the recommendations that are needed for those children in terms of services, visitation, um, evaluations, all types of things. And so they monitor the children and advocate for their needs. A dedicated one-to-one. -one. So is it her child? Like, uh, if there's a family of two. It may be a whole family. Okay. It may be five kids in a family. It might be two. Um, but every child has a guardian appointed to them. And sometimes it may be all the children in a family. Sometimes it may be separate, depending on what the issues are. I got it. That's what I was looking for. Thank you, Mike. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? Commissioner uh, Mitchell? Okay, you, you, you just mentioned, is this person being switched from one to the other? You said the DA to... Or Help me out. Ms. Thinking. Roberts worked in my office okay. as a guardian ad litem, and she um, accepted a position in the DA's office mm -hmm. as a child advocate. And so that left the position in my office open. Got it. So, 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 so I can make you understand. So, what, what are we doing here, though, other than moving? Just this? accepting the new hire for the position that's in my office. Okay, there's a new hire that you actually get ready to employ. Yes. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, tab number seven, authorization to accept <coughs> checks from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office inmate commissary account in the amount of $274.56 for the purchase of electric razors and scissors, scissors for inmate haircuts. <coughs> um, Page of Good morning, Madam Good Chair and fellow commissioners. Um, this is something that we all presented last year, kind of an annual thing. Uh, they're replacing the uh, electric razors and scissors for the inmates that are designated to do haircuts for other inmates. And 
That's what these, that's actually two checks, and they total $274.56. That's to replace the equipment that they're using. Okay. Let's get a question from the board. Commissioner Robson. Razors? Electric. Electric razors. <laughs> And, and again, it, you guys got this. I, it just made me think when I read it over the weekend, it was like razors, and then I'm thinking that you break it apart. I mean, you guys got this, right? I, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're good. Yeah, it was just, you, you got it. I'm with you. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, they're kept locked up. Just so you know, they're kept up locked up and secure until they use them. When they use them, they do. They run a little barbershop, more or less. Okay, that's, that's why I say it's not a barbershop. You're not distributed yes. to the inmates directly. Yes. It's a controlled atmosphere. You come yes. in. Okay. Yes. Thanks, sir. Yes. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Tab number eight, authorization to accept a check from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office jail inmate account in the amount of $2,164.07 for prisoner care uh, medicine. I'm sorry, prisoner care medicine. Major Holmes again. Yes, what this amount is, is uh, it's a six-month amount of money it ran from July 1st, 2017 to December 31st that we collected, and it's uh, sheriff's fees that were collected from inmates for medical, um, for doctor's visit, for um, the dental, and for some medicines. There's a, a copayment fee, a copayment that's charged, and I believe we've discussed this in previous meetings, $5 for a doctor's visit. Um, that's what this is. This money is what's been collected for that time period, and we're turning it over to be put in the general fund. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the board? All right. Thank you. Tab number nine. Oh, wow. Well, another grant. Authorization to accept a grant from the Petco uh, Foundation in an amount of $11,000 <coughs> for Douglas County Animal Services to provide spay and neuter services and authorize the chairman to design all related documents and amend the budget. And thank you so much, uh, Director McCullough, and I know you and uh, the External Affairs Director took these to a standing room, uh, very diligently to get this grant. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, the money will be used to um, fund a spay and neuter and medical care for 100 animals uh, to be adopted. We hope this uh, brings our adoption rate increase up by 9%. We'll also use the funds to spay and neuter 100 feral cats and to purchase 10 new humane feral cat traps uh, so we can take care of our feral population and get them into a good situation where they have homes. Okay, any questions from the Board of Commissioners? <laughs> Commissioner Board Care? Uh, right in my uh, comfort zone. Uh, first of all, just a, a couple, couple of remarks. Uh, we were able to get them corroborate this, we're able to get this grant because we now meet Petco standards for an animal shelter and the services provided there, which previously we did not. Uh, and so that uh, that facilitated, plus the, of course, the diligent work of the, of the two directors working on the grant. Uh, and uh, number two, I think, uh, as we will have a, our third annual spay and neuter fundraiser coming up April 21st <laughs> at Deer Lick, uh, I would like to, uh, if you would handle this, invite uh, some Petco representatives or the general manager, the manager of the store, uh, to attend that. I'll buy the ticket for them. Nobody's free, but uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll buy the ticket if they'll, if they'll come to this event. And we'll make this a, a very brief uh, announcement item uh, at, at the uh, Spay and Neuter uh, fundraiser. And uh, I had something else, but you know, if I don't write it down, I forget it. So uh, <laughs> April 21st, uh, Deer Lake, 6 to 10. And uh, thank you for your work on that. You. Madam Chairman, I make one comment as well. Yes. Old Peacock. Uh, this grant, uh, even though it's not $100,000, it was a grant that our prior uh, grant consultant, Angie Brewer and Associates, worked on with us. Mm -hmm. So this is part of their continuing effort to help us get grants. Yes. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any Good news. Thank you, Francis. Oh, uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, there was a, a, a question about what is a, a feral cat. And a feral cat is just a uh, cat that's born in the wild. And uh, they're very, almost impossible to domesticate when they're mature. And uh, so the, the best way to handle that a lot of times, uh, I would say, other than uh, some of the more brutal means, is to uh, spay and neuter the, the ferals and then just release them so over time your uh, feral population dwindles away. Yes, we release them into areas where people want them. They're excellent uh, pest control 
Um, so we make sure they have a place where somebody's going to look after. They're also microchipped so we can manage their vaccinations and um, make sure somebody's feeding them. But they still are of effective pest control, even being fed. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Director uh, Thank you. Anybody have questions for us regarding family cats? Thank you. Uh, tab number 10, authorization to change the name of Douglas Hill Road from Thornton Road to Six Flags Drive to Switch Way. Director. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Uh, Valentine. <laughs> good morning, my good Chair morning. and Commissioners. Um, unfortunately, I do not have a grant associated with this, at least not <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, we're seeking authorization to change the name of uh, a segment of Douglas Hill uh, east of Thornton Road uh, to switch way. There are three parcels uh, along that stretch, and none of them other than switch uh, front on that uh, particular segment. So, uh, in essence, this would facilitate uh, folks who are headed for that facility uh, finding their way to, to switch. Uh, we have, if this item moves, moves slower, we will have a, um, the first sign to switch, a street name sign, uh, tomorrow. So, we will, get, we will have a sample of what the sign looks like, and uh, that will be available at, before you vote. Any questions from the board of commissioners? Question, Maxie. Uh, yeah, in, 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 somebody beyond you may have the answer. And if Chris Pumphrey's not here, was is this was this part of? Um, I won't say part of the incentive plan, but um, an, an additional condition to have <coughs> this street named after them was this strategic on our part to give. I mean, what was? What was the impetus of the, the change? I'm just curious. It's not a condition, but it was a request of the switch. They requested it months ago. We had plenty of time to get this into effect, okay. and we were going to bring it up to the board after um, the uh, abatement that was on the agenda last time. Okay. All right, so uh, that, you've answered it correctly. That's all I was looking for. So, okay. And, and it did require some coordination with Cobb County because there was a little slivery. Of county along that stretch, uh, but they're they're fine with us proceeding with this. Okay. Very good. I yield now, Jerry. Okay, Commissioner Midget. And and you did say it was like about two businesses that are that that's going to be affected by this, correct? Or the other two businesses. Well, there's actually one other business, uh, Google, and and they they mm -hmm. do not front on this road. They do have access from the road, but they do not have an address along this stretch. And then there okay. is a smaller parcel near the corner of uh, Six Flags mm -hmm. that is partially in Douglas County and partially in Cobb, mm -hmm. but there is nothing on there as of yet. Got so it. there are no other, uh, there's no need for anyone to change their address right. as a result of this. There, there's no, I mean, other than you've spoken with Cobb and, and others in reference to this versus having to notify several other individuals. There's no need for that. There's been uh, discussions uh, between uh, Switch and Google, and they're okay with that as well. And what will be that process? I mean, once we kind of approve this, will you say you want to bring the sign tomorrow, and the sign goes up, and everybody is kind of moving in that direction, or is that going to be a, another type of process? What that process is? Um, I believe, uh, unless a resolution is uh, required as part of the formal change. Uh, essentially, this will affect a change in the official county map. Right. Uh, uh, so, to the extent that there is a resolution required, we would move with that. Uh, but that would be uh, uh, a legal question. Yeah, to our knowledge, no, mm -hmm. that's not the case. We haven't done that in the past. Okay. As far as having a resolution, and as far as the street name sign, we'll just install it and do all. The, we'll change the maps behind the scenes. Right. Okay. So all that will happen. So that way, no it, it'll be documented in what date and time and, yes, sir. and, and registered with the court and, and all that kind of good stuff. So. Mm -hmm. I, I missed part of it because I was looking some up as far as the official adoption of the road. Right. What we obviously will want is deeded. I mean, by ordinance, we're supposed to get them deeded in. They haven't always in the past, Miguel. We'd like that portion deeded if we're going to take responsibility for it and record it. Correct. And y'all would accept that deed. 
It's already done. It's already done. Yes. Oh, God, stop. Okay. Shut up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you wake up. You were researching. You were researching. I was racing. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Commissioner Gutter. Wait, did you yield? Yeah, I, I want to make sure. Commissioner Geyer? Yes. Does this affect our new fire station on Douglas Hill? No, ma'am. No. Okay. It's on the other side. So that's still going to be called Douglas Hill? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, okay. Commissioner Robson. Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell's point. Um, when you say update your thing, will you update? Does it, in our process of, 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 of legal um, um, updates, Will the technological that supports that, such as the GPS, be automatically updated? Because again, you put in waves and so forth, and you still don't make it switch wave because it's looking for something else. Does that get updated, or how does it work? We we would provide that information. There there, uh, there are services that um, that feed both uh, the GPS component and the mapping uh, uh, enterprises. And uh, periodically, they will send requests for updated information from the county. We would provide that information to them. Uh, we could reach out to them, and, and once the uh, name change is approved, uh, give them that information. It's going to take them a little while to make the change uh, on the map side, perhaps a little quicker on the GPS side. Okay. The reason I ask, and it's almost like our GIS maps, we go out frequently and take uh, we, we use our drones, we take pictures of everything, the little maps we have in our, all our respective offices of, of, of our districts. And, you know, again, we pay for that service, and it's, but we know the need to refresh. Um, is there any formal approach to making sure that things are refreshed? I mean, we, we talk about it. We, we want to keep our county clean. We want to keep it innovative. We want to keep it on the edge. What are we doing to proactively make sure that we're pushing versus what, as opposed to waiting for them to sort of request us? Why can't we be a little bit more assertive in, in, in pushing. We at least we want our stuff updated. We can't worry about everybody else who may be waiting for them to push back. But is there like how hard is it to sort of get a get a formal, uh, recurring, refresh quarterly, half a year, every year? How does that work? I'm just curious. Well, we could certainly make make a request uh, of of those uh, you know whether it's on the mapping side or or the GPS. And uh, they put it into the into the mill, <coughs> and however long it takes them to refresh and, yep. and to update, uh, then uh, once we make the request, it'll be uh, depending on their workload and how quickly they get to that sort of thing. But um, it's, it's you bring up a good point, and again, I won't belabor it. But if we, we think about the, the truck routes um, uh, changes. We, we talk about uh, the ones that we were had in our, our recent planning and zoning. Uh, we talk about um, 166 bedding in at Fairborough Road as far as trucks and putting up signs. We talked about veterans, highway changes, right? I'm hearing three or four changes that are coming down that how do we, that, that are supposed to detour people, guide people, give instructions to people beyond just um, local hard um, assets. I, Something to think about. I know you're getting your mind around it. You and the county administrator will work this out. This is just sort of a suggestion to sort of be a little bit more proactive since I always hear just the thought, well, GPS will guide us. And, and I, we know that that's not always the best. You know, you wind up on the other side of, you know, town when you try to follow certain things. And, and, and to your point, Commissioner, uh, I, didn't, I didn't understand uh, the question being from that angle, but uh, th there is a way uh, through uh, services that Georgia DOT and us we can reach out to ways and services like that and uh, proactively get them to get that information out. It is not an official change, but it does get the word out to the trucking industry and others that that change has taken place and they can avail themselves of that information earlier. Let's give consideration to that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for uh, Director Valentino? Okay. Thank you. Tab number 11, 12, and 13. Director Watson, uh, good morning. Good morning. Tab number 11, authorization for the chairman and the county attorney to sign a 2018 Federal Transit Administration clauses for rideshare multimodal transportation services. Yes, ma'am. As a recipient of Federal Transit Administration grant funds, 
there's all sorts of rules, regulations, guidelines, and policies that we have to follow. And one of those guidelines is that each year, uh, the chairman of the board of the commissioners and our county attorney has to sign off on the Federal Transit Administration certifications and assurances. And these are basically 24 areas that, that guide the direction that our program uh, has to go in. Uh, these particular certifications and assurances were reviewed by uh, staff paralegal Jennifer Moore. She says they're good to go. And I'm just asking for authorization for the chairman and the county attorney to sign these certifications and assurances. These are the same as in the past, and I've reviewed them too, and they're required. Okay. <laughs> Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Comments? All right, we'll move on to tab tw number 12. Authorization to approve the 2018 updated rise year multimodal fitness for duty drug and alcohol program required for all Federal Transit Administration grantees. Yes, ma'am. One of the areas in the certifications and assurances is, is uh, drug and alcohol policy. We've had this policy in place uh, for a good while. Uh, the Board of Commissioners last approved an update in 2014, and today what we're doing is just updating the policy to reflect the most recent Federal Transit Administration changes in their alcohol and drug policy. And basically what these, the revisions are that we're making today, we're adding uh, some additional people that this policy uh, applies to. Uh, the policy is clarifying what a positive test is on a, an alcohol test. Um, and it adds a, a brand new section uh, about over-the-counter medications and prescription medications and how we would deal with them. <coughs> and again, this policy was reviewed by our staff, a paralegal, and she gave it the go-ahead to, to move forward. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Mitchell? Yeah, just for clarity, I apologize for going back to the 11 and 12, but what does this have to do with, if any, uh, with the, the busing system? Is that, does this have anything I'm not off base? The, the only thing that it would have to do with the bus system is that would be part of the overall Federal Transit Administration program uh, that we have. And even if we didn't have the, the bus system in place, uh, we would still have to have it for the programs that we already do have in place. The, the Van Poo program, yes ma'am, the voucher program. Not necessarily Greta, because there, we don't really get any funding for Greta, but for our Van Poo program, the voucher program, we would be required to have this, this policy. So, with the, the busing system, what tie-in does it have so I can make sure I'm clearly getting my head around what you're saying about what well, we're going to be doing. Okay, if, if, if we initiate the this. bus system, oh. uh, the... If we initiate it and we vote for this tomorrow, what, 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 what the, what's the tie-in of the busing system? Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. If, okay. we, if we initiate the bus system, the, the particular individuals in the bus program who are considered safety-sensitive, they would be required uh, to be part of the drug and al alcohol testing program. Okay. okay. So that's the tie-in. Okay. Correct. Okay. That's that's eleven or I guess it's part of the eleven and or twelve. Well, well twelve is <coughs> more of the drug and alcohol program versus eleven. Am I correct? Uh, eleven <coughs> tells you that you have to have a drug and alcohol policy mm -hmm. and then twelve is the actual drug and alcohol policy that we have to have. Yeah. And that, that will tie in the busing system in the event that it or don't where it goes. Yes. Sir. Okay. So I'll make sure that, that we you know being honest. Sure. Uh, okay. Commissioner Guider. He got making huge All right. Um this is something we do every year. This is, uh, I'm, I'm going back to 11 and 12. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, this is something we do every year, and we have to do it in order to have the voucher system and the ride share yes, system. Yes, ma'am. Doesn't have anything to do with yes, the you don't, you don't do this, you don't get Federal Transit Administration. But I do know that um, he referred to uh, Commissioner 
Rachel uh, uh, referred to the bus system, and it was about the CMAC grant. And if it's ever accepted, it is flexed over to the Federal Transportation yes, Administration. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're mm -hmm. not doing that with this. Uh, this is for funds that we're already getting. We're not approving any bus system here. <laughs> no, no, ma'am. But but if if, if, and if when we, we did, do it, it, if it if would we fall did, under this. It had yes. to be flexed over to the Federal Transportation. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, but this has nothing to it's do. It's existing with. and future. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You could. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions uh, regarding uh, 11 and 12? Yeah, why not? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> why not? Okay. Yeah. It's an important debate. Um, this, this one is important um, from the perspective of, I, I want to address um, what we're approving here. Uh, it, it was some comments made about the difference between CNAC. Uh, we've already approved the bus system. Let's not confuse what mm -hmm. we stop. <laughs> we've approved the bus system as it relates to what we've approved five years ago to move forward with this. Maybe it was on the table, and I want to clarify so that there's not any miscommunication, at least from my perspective, is that maybe there's a consideration of do we accept the CMAC grant, which has to come later on. But as far as moving forward with the initiative to expand what we've done, we've passed that. that. So you hear that out there from time to time. Well, the citizen will well, we going do the bus system or not do the bus system. Well, the bus system, that vote has already passed. That vote passed. Now, we're talking about the funding of it, which is a different situation. There's some thoughts about routes. That has to, you know, okay. But I, we, we, we're towing, and I, I'm very definitive, very straight on. Now, we're past that. But if one wants to come back around, <coughs> we have another chance to sort of talk about a different aspect of it. Let's have that conversation. But I, for the citizens of the district, too, it's important that we pass that. There is no coming back. You, you don't do over. You don't kick over. There's no repeal. You move forward, and you catch the next time that you can make a decision on some aspect of the program. But I don't, yeah, you know, I, I get concerned about innuendo. I get concerned about sort of um, mis-messaging. Um, and and it's, let's, let's be clear, as it was just stated, with our citizens about what we're doing, what it's about. The next decision point would be about CMAX, right? Let's, let's, let's keep it clear so we don't get out there and we're putting all these messages out there and I, I get it's election moment. I get it. And I'll stay out of that. I'll stay out of people's elections. But at the same point, I, I can't get wrapped up into the, the, the false narratives and the false facts that are put out there about where we are. And so I, I just wanted to make that statement and I'll yield back to the next one. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. And you said this bus system was before me, right? Before our, before Ramona, right? Voted before me. Before Madam BM. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you bet. <laughs> Okay, uh, as, as far as the transportation study that was done, the only thing that this board of commissioners ever approved was to move on the lower uh, end of that recommendation. That's the only thing that's out there. And so anything extending outside of Douglas County has not been approved by this board, and it has nothing to do with election year. I can assure you, uh, this is uh, something that we we know that has just kind of been hijacked or whatever. But there will be a day that this is going to be reckoned, mm -hmm. and I yield back. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments from board commissioners? <coughs> All right, we'll move to tab number thirteen. Tab number 13 says authorization to negotiate a contract for branding and public outreach services for multimodal transportation services and programs with the collaborative firm LLC recommended by the Transportation Committee not to exceed $50,000 subject to final legal review. Um, Director Watson, tell us about this. Back in 2015 and 2016 when we were conducting the transportation services study. One of the things that we learned is that the public did not know about the rideshare multimodal uh, services and programs. They didn't know about the transportation center. They didn't know about our manpool program. 
They didn't know about the uh, voucher program. They didn't know about the express bus uh, service. They, in short, they knew nothing about us and they had never used any of our, our services. And then on top of that, when we started talking about implementing uh, a bus service, we realized that, that we needed to do a better job. We needed a, a better vehicle on um, telling the public uh, what we were trying to do. So the conclusion that we came to is that we needed a total new branding of the services that we have now and the services that we will have um, in the future. Uh, this is something that the Transportation Committee has talked about for, for over a year. And then several months ago, uh, the Transportation Committee recommended and the Board of Commissioners authorized us to issue a request for qualification from firms to help us with a, a branding effort and a public outreach effort. Uh, we sent the RFQ out to about 15 firms we received five written responses. We brought the top three firms in for face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, we did that last week. Uh, all three presentations were very good. They were excellent. But the firm that we chose to, to go forward with is the collaborative firm. And the reason that we chose them is that they had a, a really good specific uh, plan on how to do their the public outreach part uh, of, of this request that we issued. And so for that, uh, our request to the Board of Commissioners today is to authorize us to negotiate with the collaborative firm uh, on a marketing and outreach program uh, not to exceed $50,000. Okay. Any questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Mulcair. Quick statement. Uh, let's pretend the word bus never existed. <laughs> this, uh, this program, outreach, education, to explain, to, to bring before the public and taxpayers the availability of transportation, intermodal, uh, system here in Douglas County, be it, be it Red Oak or, or Rise Share or Voucher Program and so forth, is to educate the public. Yes, sir. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Accurate statement? Correct. So it is a set aside strategy independent of whether there are the word I mentioned before or not. <laughs> is that accurate statement? Yes, sir. And, and one mm -hmm. of the things that I emphasize uh, during our meeting Friday is that while the information on what you said not to mention is, is, <laughs> is, 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 is it important, it's just as important that we get the word out on our existing services because they're being underutilized. Okay. And, and to be honest, were we to move forward on the word to be remain unmentioned at this point, uh, then that would be all that would be incorporated into the total plan, but this is a, this is a standalone initiative. It's, uh, well, we we do want to catch, we do want to get word out about the bus service, mm -hmm. and, and it's it's not it's not a referendum on whether or not we're going to have the bus service. As Commissioner Robinson said, that decision's already been made, and we don't want to use it as as a propaganda tool. Uh, to try to ram it down people's throats saying this is why we need it. This is strictly an informational program to tell them these are the routes that we're looking at, these are the hours that we're thinking about operating, and this is the, the amount that we think the fare might be. Uh, we want to put that information out to the public and let the public comment on it. It is strictly information. All right, to, to reiterate, this, this is a standalone strategy independent of whether the bus is coming to Douglas County. Yes. Okay, I yield back. Okay, any other comment? Commissioner Geiger. <laughs> um, what routes are you putting out there? The, the last four that... Uh, we see the, the two that were supplemented 
to the CMAC grant has never been approved by this board. So that is fake news. <laughs> Uh, it has not been approved by this board. The only thing that's been approved, what we've been talking for two years about, was in county, in <coughs> county. Uh, your transportation committee is the one that supplemented it with two outside Douglas County routes. That has not been approved by this board. Never has even been talked about by this board. So uh, I would like for this item to be a separate item on the, I don't want it on the consent agenda because I do not agree with the branding. Information is one thing, but it, it better be right information because you're going to stir a hornet's nest here. You can't put something out there if we have not approved it. I'll, whatever the full board of commissioners tells me to, to put out there is what I'll do. I understand, I understand. But That's you cannot proceed is. with brand, uh, putting four bus routes out there when this board has not approved those bus routes. Now, if you want to put a, a vote for the public to be out there, that's one thing. <coughs> Y'all vote to see whether or not you want uh, two routes or four routes. But we never even talked about four routes until after August of 2017 when Marta was brought to the table. And that's the route that they wanted. Marta wanted the direct route from Douglas County to H.E. Homes. It's in the notes that you gave me. And lo and behold, that's, it's out there now. That's what y'all supplemented. But y'all didn't even present this to us till three days after you sent it to ARC. I'll so, let y'all work through that. I understand. <laughs> Yeah. It's not your fault, but we we put the cart before the horse here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like for this uh, not to be on the consent agenda. I hear you loud and clear. I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, out of the research that I've done, and I'm is before, madam, but uh, I love to see where the first two routes voted on as well. I tried to I looked through all the literature. I didn't see where the route specific routes were voted on at all. So the first two were not voted on. So that's why I don't want to give the well. The, I uh, just the, image. the the information about being inside Douglas County. We in the study. If you'll look at the work session uh, before uh, we ever even approved the study. It says that we were going to start with the lower end, lower end, which is five hundred thousand dollars for capital, a hundred for M and O, and that's the only thing we uh, agreed to. And now we're up to over a million dollars if this passes. So we agreed to start with the lower end. Soon after that, you presented us with two routes going looping in Douglas County and that I was there. Mm -hmm. I know what happened. And I know what happened after August of 2017. I was able to pull some uh, information and just saying I that but just but two routes, just for one route is a million dollars. That's why I'm, I'm a little concerned about that five hundred thousand. One route is one million, one point two million. And then if you have two routes, meaning you know that's two point four million. So I'm just not sure where the 500000 That was in the from. study. That was the study. That was the level of uh, estimated cost in the study, and I can show it to you. So I think those, those, uh, that study, this projection, we could talk about it offline a little bit. Well, that's what we agreed on, though. That's the only thing we agreed on, to go with the study okay. that we paid for. But I'm just saying the study, the study that you had, the projection of $500,000 is capital funds. And we, I learned some things quickly. What the uh, F, what is it? FTA funds or capital funds? And they're, uh, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, they're just so that's so you can buy the buses and so on and so forth. But a CMAC grant is for operating. So I had to do my homework and learn as well what the two different pots of money was for. So the five hundred thousand is for capital costs to buy things such as buses or. Uh, and we have equipment. the buses. Right. We already have the buses. So that's so what that five hundred thousand dollars was for. It. Well, we can use it whatever we want to, but I'm just saying we never approved the two routes outside of Douglas County. The people of Douglas County, I don't know about District 2, 
but I know a lot of District 1 and a lot of District, all of District 4 and probably a lot of District 3 is against it. Well, I was just, just just giving you some of the facts that I had a chance to research. But ma'am, I've, I've got a book. You've seen my binder. Mm -hmm. I've got a binder on this uh, this whole bus system, mm -hmm. and I can show you the conversation that we put out to the public that uh, the director here put in the newspaper about the in county bus system. And after Marta came to the table secretly, they. Um, they wanted the bus route from Douglas County to A.G. Holmes. Well, we hadn't even talked about it, but somehow or another, it was added to the grant after we had submitted the grant with the two routes. So, no, it has not been approved. Okay. Any, okay. any other questions? Okay. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, thank you. No, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, again, one more time, there's only one portion of one route that goes outside the county, goes from Thornton Road to Holmes. Um, there was actually three routes that were considered. This is when we were in the minority position. I'm very clear on this. Um, Thornton Road, Riverside was always a route. This is Randy Holsey's commentary where, okay, what, what, was it how we go, Mark, the county administrator, he said, well, we'll get to Thornton Road, Riverside. We started with two routes. <coughs> there was a third route that was, well, we'll get to that in 17. Oh, we'll get that in 18. Of course, the elections came and went and it shifted. But it's always been three routes. Always been three routes. I've got the, two challenge, the challenge that I have with that, though, to go to, to have Thornton Road by itself, and I appreciate one of the comments that was on Facebook, it's like, okay, that's down there by itself. How do you connect? You got two routes running around the mall and through the mall. You got this independent route down here on Thornton Riverside. How do you connect them? How do we fulfill our workforce development? How do we fulfill our economic development? How do we recognize that's the engine that drives the county to a certain extent, in addition to the, to the mall? Right, so there's a need to connect the two routes to that third route, which is the fourth route. Now, whether you choose to go beyond, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll buy the conversation that let's talk about the regional play that had nothing to do with us prior to us having those conversations. This is how do we get from Thornton to Holmes? I'm okay with that. I can have that conversation. But you gotta connect, you gotta connect the system. You can't have this route just going lunchtime up and down Thornton Riverside. It makes no sense. That's where the jobs are. If, 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 think about it. You, so if we've got all the paperwork that we say that we got, then surely you know that Thornton Riverside was always a third route. Politically, of course, the majority is like, well, we'll get to that later. Okay, I'm fine. I get it. It's on the list. I, I get what it means to be in a minority position. No problem. There's no hijacking. There's no, I don't do back doors. I go through front doors. I look straight in your face and say, no, I don't do that. That's important. All right? But what's important is just, let's just acknowledge what we're at. Um, Madam Chair, I agree without belaboring this, because this, this is not the debate. If, if somebody, well, um, I mean, it'll come a time where we will, transportation committee will, um, have public input, and as well as I think it's important that the Board of Commissioners as a whole have public input on this later. But for right now, as of all the belaboring this, there is the need to educate the community on the four services that we currently offer um, and consideration for something potential. No more than looking at different various, um, 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 what do you want to call it, truck route options. These are just options. It's just, hey, what do you think about this? Ask the public their opinion. You're out there, you're educating, get their insight. That, there's nothing wrong with that, but I agree with Madam Guider. Um, make it a separate item tomorrow. We'll just keep it. Let's go. Okay. Any other comments? Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. There's a lot that's probably have transpired, but this thing has evolved uh, very unique. I've probably had several town halls and or coffee and conversations about that particular setting. From your from your best knowledge, because it has made some changes have been kind of made, whether it's internally or directed to yourself and so on, because I was kind of set aside, not understanding and knowing kind of where we are. And <clears throat> the vice chair and I had probably numerous conversations about where we are, what's next, and when I'm out and about having conversations. So at what point did, whether it's the route, the finances, 
when did some of that stuff kind of change? Because I, I just recently saw the last the last route um, as to where we are. I just for the last few weeks I did like Madam Chair and everybody else and, and research this thing to kind of make sure that I'm speaking the same language. But come to find out, I wasn't. That's what's concerning me now. As to I'm a little confused as to what it is. Uh, at least what it was and now what it is. So you you mentioned you mentioned the most recent change of you set the roots or something around and went from one to another. I mean, one it was two, now we had four, now we're going to homes, uh, now we help, we help the general public and myself to understand that first. Well, th this has been an ever-evolving process. From the very beginning, it's been an ever-evolving process. And Commissioner Goddard is right, in the initial CMAC application, there were two routes. Uh, to basically serve the Douglasville area. As the process went along, uh, the Atlanta Regional Commission came back to us and said that these routes weren't going to score us well in the CMAC uh, modeling process. So we've had to make some changes. Uh, we we when changed did you get that directive to make the changes. Early, I mean, not early, exactly early in the process early in the process after we had submitted the application. But we went from those initial two routes, mm -hmm. we, we combined those two routes into, into one route, mm -hmm. we went back to, to three routes, and then we finally settled on four routes because those, those are the four routes that the Atlanta Regional Commission accepted and said that, that those are the routes that would make us most competitive and that in the CMAC application. The committee, or from whom that gave you that direction to do that? We we changed the routes, basically under the direction of the Atlanta Regional Commission because they were saying that the routes that we were submitted were not going to score well, and that's they they ended up giving us a deadline when they said this by this date you need to have some routes together for us uh, that are going to make you competitive in this process. And That's when we brought on a consultant to help us uh, devise these four routes. So when you did do all that, um, and I'll, I know we won't get to the timeline because it could get very confusing, um, did, did the committee, who's led by the, the vice chair, did, were they aware of any changes? Because I think this board has always asked about any changes, or what's new on the horizon. Because I went through the last few weeks reading minutes, looking at tapes and everything, and trying to find kind of when it evolved to what I don't know now. And, and I'm very transparent with those who I represent, very honest and open with what that is. But I've been singing on a different hymn note from what's being said. And, and uh, my constituents challenged me to say, you sure that's what you're saying is correct? And it isn't, and it wasn't. So now I'm concerned about where we are now. So back to my initial question. Did the vice chair and those guys know as to when that change occurred, or did it just kind of slip beside everybody other than ARC, just the one who knew about the change? Committee was kept up to date about what was going on, and when we when we did work with our consultant and have those those four routes finalized uh, by the consultant, uh, I presented them at a transportation committee meeting. I think the date was October the 16th, something like that. Uh, 10th. 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 I'm sorry. Uh, the, the committee gave the go ahead to go through with them and then uh, I think that next week uh, in a commission work session I presented the those routes on the 16th, on the 16th, the 16th. To, to the full board. <laughs> and this only deals with the application. The, anything, you know, if ARC approves this, gives the county the grant or says, you know, it still has to go back to the board for approval. Oh, Y'all have a final say, so this is just part of the application process. I, I truly understand, but my concern is, 
the conversation I've been having with my constituency, it's had been totally different than what we're talking about. So that's my concern, and I've shared it with uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, and, and, and it concerns me about the transparency mm -hmm. of, of what all of this has evolved into. Uh, I don't want to belabor this, but I've got some concerns. Got I will. Some. I will say that yeah. once we. Once we settled on those four routes and they were presented to the Transportation Committee, the Sentinel had a story on those those four routes, and then we also put them on our web page. Well, and I'm not even worried about the, I'm not even concerned about the approval side of it. I, I just don't. I, I went back through the tapes. I went back through all the information. And I read a whole lot of stuff, and either I missed something. Um, not totally true. I mean, your statement is true, but not totally true. So, my transparency with those who I represent is very open and honest. They know I'm, I'm more a straight shooter. It's about the process, it's about the honesty of what this is. I've uh, been very supportive of the transportation project and won't use the other word that my colleagues <laughs> use, and been very supportive of that. And I think I, I, I feel and know the need. But I can't make it personal on changes that you sold, not you, in the record, that, that changes are being made. Um, and not only I'm not aware of it, I think some of the board members are not as well. And I mean, and I, I updated myself with um, the, the vice chair and who's the, who's the committee chair. And I've always tried to make sure I stay on point. I'm always trying to make sure I'm reading everything that's kind of out there. So I spent weeks now just trying to get caught up again and see what did I miss. And it was very disappointing as to what I saw. So um, I'll leave it at that. And uh, like um, Commissioner Geiger, I think we probably should take this off outside of the, um, and I will support that, to, to take it uh, outside of the consent agenda. Um, and we'll kind of belabor this whole thing. So. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll clarify real quick. Um, this is for the Transportation Committee. Um, when the presentation was made to the, the, the Transportation Committee, um, the, the, the ARC application was not presented to the Board of Committee, um, was not presented to the Committee. It was a presentation, right? Um, that was an overview of the routes. Um, I think specifically, um, and I'm not going to speak on his behalf, um, but I'm, I'm going to speak to what I understood <coughs> to Commissioner Mitchell was, is that there was an, a, a, a path alteration coming across the railroad tracks um, from his district down, pretty much straight down William Street, right? That's what I understand his issue is that I didn't know about, right? Um, I didn't know about it because obviously I created a whole video that went down that path, not knowing that the actual detail to that had been changed. Um, and that's why I asked you for the, the, the formal pa um, packet uh, uh, um, a couple weeks ago, which you delivered to me, and to which I um, confirmed for Commissioner Mitchell that the change um, had hurt, happened. That being said, um, again, I, I think it's, it, we just wanted to clarify that. Um, just, it, it was important that the Transportation Committee goes on what's presented as routes. We did talk about it in our committee, um, in this meeting, whatever the next week was, um, having everybody here, um, all five commissioners were here um, present at that, um, that full work session. That being said, I just wanted to clarify for the record that the routes were not changed um, um, or implied that they were changed at the Transportation Committee. When staff makes recommendations, it's like, okay, um, unless you tell me that there's a change to anomaly, and we ask the questions and stuff, and it's, you don't say anything. And then we come to the next meeting, we say, oh, by the way, there's a change. That sort of, that does subvert the committee structure to a certain extent. It does. All right, so I'm a, you know, yes. you're not pretty. Yes. Yes. Straightforward about mm -hmm. like no that you you can't do that because that puts me in an awkward place because I'm looking at him and he's like what happened I'm like well so staff you, you again you know how I'll, I'll get to this place where y'all got to do better that, that that we shouldn't be here I, I shouldn't be at odds with this moment um, but I, I I take it fully you know that it came through the transportation committee um, I, again you, you catch it. But it was sort of like a, it felt like a sleight of hand in Ashley. It's like, oh, come on, guys. I didn't get a whole video. You know, I didn't know. If I did a video to say that the route was going this way, and then, wait a minute, it didn't? That's, that's the concern. So 
Uh, I don't disagree, and I, I think respectfully that it's, you know, we can, you know, let it come outside the consent agenda and allow mm -hmm. you to speak freely. Is that fair? Uh, fair enough. Okay. Fair. Commissioner Bulk here. Yeah, I think I need to say my piece uh, on this as part of the uh, member of the Transportation Committee. Uh, I did recognize that it was a, uh, a change from, from two routes to four routes. The expression was exactly as uh, uh, Director Gary mentioned that this would make it more attractive in terms of acquiring the grant. And we were all uh, supportive uh, prior to President uh, Chairman. We were all supportive of the, of the two route circulator van system. Mm -hmm. Not buses, but vans. Yes, Circul circulator vans van system, we were unanimous in that, in that support. So I was, uh, coming from the uh, consultant, I was somewhat surprised to see the addition of uh, four routes, including the, uh, the uh, Holmes Marta Station extension. And I expressed concerns to Chairman Kelly on that, uh, that particular route. Uh, I did ask the question, are these set in stone? response was no they can be tweaked mm -hmm. now I think perhaps I'm remiss in what tweak means mm -hmm. maybe I'm maybe I'm out of sync with uh, what ARC thinks is tweak or director Watson or anybody else in the lounge but I took it, I took it to mean we could change the routes mm -hmm. modify the routes and uh, therefore I yield back <clears throat> and I believe I have the same impression too uh, uh, Director Watson, as we, do, you know, I spoke about those routes. I said, are they set in stone? You said, no, they can be moved. Uh, also, if the ridership is not uh, healthy, we can move them. And uh, just all the literature I reviewed, none of your routes are stable. You send them in bold print, they could be changed at any time. So everything, it's been a moving target. So those routes have just been really all over the place, even starting from, I believe, 2014 or 15, when you all started, I had an opportunity to read. So I believe you, so, I, mean, I just want to reiterate or make sure uh, for the public, you said those routes, once they come in, they it can be moved. And then we talked about maybe a phase-in portion. It may not, you, you don't have to start all four routes day one. It could be the Holmes route could go three years from now. You said, but we had to utilize the grant. Um, yes, that does. But you said that you still could move it if it so does that. Sure. So and that's what I asked. Yeah, and, and as, as you implement the service, and as we bring on our, our third party operator and they start looking at the routes, there, there's going to be changes that, for instance, they might, they might tell you, well, we can't make a left turn, hand turn off of this street onto this route. So they, they may make a right hand turn instead of a left hand turn. So there's going to be changes like that. I mean, it, it would be foolish for us to think that the routes are going to, to end up exactly like we have them right now. Commissioner Fader? Yes, uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, Director uh, Watson, I asked you on January the 9th on camera if we were going to be pretty much tied to these four routes, and you said yes, ma'am. That's right. So, as far as when we tweak them, we can't say we're not going to AG Homes or we're not going down Riverside Parkway into Cobb County to pick up people there. By the way, <coughs> we bring them to work at our facilities that we abate taxes on. That doesn't make sense. The whole idea was to take workers and seniors and disabled people around Douglas County to the work. So, um, so when you say we cannot we cannot do away with the H.E. Holmes, the direct line. You, you said that on camera, pretty much. Well, and, and going down, uh, you're talking about, when you say tweet, you're talking about bus stops, or maybe you may have to divert the bus a, a different way to get to a certain place. But you're not talking about doing away with those two outside county routes. You have to have a starting place somewhere. So what, what we would do, we would start with four routes, run them for a while and, and see how they're doing. It, it might be... <coughs> do, uh, do Director, uh, ARC does not run Douglas County. I'm sorry. No, but they hold uh, the they, purse they strings. They hold the purse strings. But ARC came back wanting us to combine the two looping routes 
into one route. That's in your notes. It is, and then they came back and told us that that wasn't working. But either. that was only after Marta came to the table. So I am just saying, we didn't, we, the board never talked about running routes, vans, buses, whatever, outside Douglas County. And I remember in the minutes of the October 10th transportation meeting, Y'all even question whether or not it should come before the entire board, and everybody <coughs> there said no. And I, I resent that. Uh, when you're going to change something of this magnitude that's going to be this uh, controversial and everything, it should, why not say it should go before the board? We're, we're the ones that have to run for election out here. We're the ones that answer to the people, and staff ought to know that. I'm, I'm talking about everybody in that room should have said, yes, it should go before the Board of Commissioners before we change this and add two outside routes. That would have taken the monkey off your back and put it on ours. So I, I resent the way that was handled, and, but um, I know that you, you work under more of the transportation uh, area of it, but you work for this entire board. Everybody in that room works for this entire board. And if we have to make a decision of this magnitude, it ought to be done by a majority of this board and not by one or two people. And I yield back. I don't know if that you can call, call the question, but uh, we, we, in, in, in a work session, we're, 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 you know, we're talking about item 13, and, and it's talking about branding and advertising our services and and uh, right. logos and, and paint jobs and, and right. a lot of stuff like that, whether they're buses <coughs> or not, whether there's two routes, four routes, or 18 routes. This item right here can stand independent of, of the bus issue because this, need, in my opinion, needs to be done. And in terms of if buses come on, on Douglas County or uh, vans come on Douglas County in a, in a, in a <laughs> circulator system or a regional aspect, it's just a question of editing. It's just a question of editing what we've developed for the entire holistic transportation system in Douglas County. So this, this issue to me is completely independent of, of the buses. Correction can be made to, to the proposal. Okay, well now we've got, uh, we've got vans. I don't know if they're gonna be much different in appearance, uh, not uh, considerably so from our, our ride share vans in terms of coloration and logos and that sort of thing. So to me, this issue stands independent of whether they have buses in Douglas County. I yield back. <clears throat> okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Yeah. I, I, I just beg to differ a little bit. Um, this, is, this, this whole system was designed and created and thought about and researched about, about the need of Douglas County. The process, I think, have gotten out of order, and it be, it's become personal to some who have made changes <coughs> and, and, and didn't quite do what I call the transparency, and that's kind of where my issue is. I'm not only concerned about what route or whatever it may or may not be, but it's got to be based on ridership, not the mere fact of where it goes, but you've got to have where it goes but we can't just kind of arbitrarily make changes or arbitrarily feel like whomever feels the need to, to make the change makes the change because I think any one of the board members could easily come back to you and say make this change add this other piece change that other piece but this is too big of an item to just kind of haphazardly not inform the general public not be honest and open and transparent with the general public versus we just added two routes or taken away three routes. But if it's not based on ridership and it's not honestly, openly stated to the general public and the process is how you see it, not how this board sees it, then I got an issue with that. Well, just let me say this. And, and, and let me say this, and, and this is the reflection of what you do. This is no reflection of you, so I don't want you to take it personal. So, but, all right, 
Well, no, I am taking it personal. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say I work at the pleasure of the Board of Commissioners, and if y'all are not happy with the job I'm doing, y'all have the power to change it. Let me make a statement. Um, all the documentation that's out there said these routes are subject to change. And I believe what we want to see today and, 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 and what you all are asking for is some concrete information that cannot be really set in stone because of the process. It's going to move, it's going to shift, and it's going to be back and forth. So everything is on all your literature, and I'll do respect to you, and thank you so much. Um, Director Watson, you have said things are subject to change. And with that, we don't have anything in place, and we have to start from somewhere. And, and you, you're going to change it again. So what happens when he changed the routes again? Because you may have to change them. And then do we, are we in this room? Are we in the same place again about routes? He's made it very clear on everything. It is subject to change. Everything is fluid right now. So I just don't know how you can set it in stone uh, without Right now, it's just pressure for no reason because we haven't tried anything. Uh, I look at it as a pilot program. It's pilot uh, for Douglas County. We're talking about we're talking about a pilot program. And Douglas County is not the only county that's upset about movement and transportation. Uh, we have regional transportation coming down the pike. Uh, believe it or not, it's being discussed at the state level. So. I'm not saying that we need to get on board, but at the same time, I'm beginning to wonder if we need to open our minds because it may eventually be put on our plates whether we want it or not. But a pilot program is simply that. And just I believe we had a question earlier about how do we fund the buses. I, I've said on numerous occasions, if, if, if we don't get a CMAC grant, the county will not go forward with this bus system. And if we do get a CMAC grant, CMAC grant it's a three-year grant. And when that grant runs out, if we, if we cannot secure another grant, we will just discontinue the services if we get the grant. The services will just be discontinued, and we have eight to nine buses that can go in our fleet now that we have. We have a fleet already of buses. I believe these buses are smaller than the buses that you use now and utilize for your seniors. They're just 12 seats. What do your senior buses have, 20 seats? They have 20, so they're just 12. They're little minivans. So if it don't work out, they can just go into the fleet. It'll just be Douglas County at least tried it. And we were on board with transportation in the state of Georgia and it didn't work out because the goal is not to put this on the backs of the taxpayers at all. We're not putting anything on the backs of the taxpayers and thus far I've been a woman of my word with taxes. We didn't raise your taxes, we rolled them back in 2017. So everything that I say regarding taxes and, and uh, as the presentation said earlier, there are only two income streams in Douglas County. We have property taxes and we have uh, sales tax. I'm from a world that we had all kinds of multiple streams of incomes, which is health care. But I realize that I'm in a different world now. So I realize that I don't want to put the pressure on the taxpayers and we don't want it to be on the taxpayers at all. So if we don't get the CMAC grant, we won't go forward. I've said that on numerous occasions. I've made it very clear that MARTA is not part of this uh, deal. Those four routes, it was in the newspaper. Uh, it says that the four routes would not be voted on. It's right there in the newspaper. I pulled it, so these routes would not be voted on. It's right there. It said the Board of Commissioners are not expected to vote on these four routes. So it's in the newspaper. I, I pulled it out. I mean, it was a lot of reading, but I found it. I said it's right. So I can show you the document, Commissioner Guider. But these four routes are subject to change. They may not work. So right now, we just, it's, we're just moving back and forth. This is a moving target. So I appreciate everything you're doing. You're doing a phenomenal job. I know it's a lot of pressure, a lot of heat. You're not going to be able to make everybody happy, but we have to start from somewhere. And do we need to start? If we don't get the grant, we won't start. We just say, well, we're back. We'll just do what we've been doing, business as usual. But uh, we need to make it clear our employees or our citizens need jobs. And to me, it's embarrassing to have big companies such as Switch and T5 here that's paying $62,000 a year, and we can't even get our own people locally. They can't get these jobs, and that, that, that breaks my heart, knowing that some people just don't have access to uh, transportation. And an article was out there recently, what do we do while we are brothers keepers? I know a lot of us can afford cars, but some people just can't afford a car, and I'm just, and you know, that's, that's personal, but of course I want to make sure that we understand we are our brothers keepers. Keepers. I don't have anything else to say. Anybody else have a comment? Oh, Commissioner Guy. 
Yeah. Yeah. One, one, one comment. Yes. The whole thing was about seniors and disabled people to begin with. You left them out. Now the workers are kicking grandma off the buses. So. And yeah, the seniors are disabled. Yeah, I did see that. I saw that seniors. That was the whole point of it. I saw seniors, with. disabled, and also I saw millennials. I saw all, part it was it was a, a part-time workers. So seniors when I hard. when I researched now, this was before my time. I had an opportunity to retail. But I saw seniors, disabled. But most of the conversation was mm -hmm. about the seniors okay. and the disabled. And you know I'm fighting and for that's the seniors. In the I'm fighting for the seniors because well, I'm leaving them out when you say it's just right. about the workers. But anyway, no, it's it's for the the seniors as well, Commissioner. That's a given. But any other questions, Commissioner? Yes, and, and I close on this. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is just kind of, and I'm just going to say it this way: it's about the process and the transparency more than anything to me. So if if we can if we can just address those two things, then as in 2015, and I'm not directing this to you, I'm just directing to the board, then I could understand and, and see where we might be going. But I can't, at this point, I can't. So I'll leave it at that, I yield. Because I mean, because we're saying a lot of stuff. I, I mean, if we talk about how great we're gonna, the ridership is gonna change, we talk about how great we're gonna move it around, it won't be, it won't be the same route, it might not be this, it might not be that. I agree. I said that in the very beginning. It's based on ridership. But we've taken a different approach of speaking to the ridership of this particular transportation system. So, yeah. Do you have anything else? Yeah. I, want you you to, I want you to close out after me, please. Give us some more. You get the last. I, 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 two separate issues that I'm hearing um, the, the seniors, and it was like a conflict of, of logic that says, okay, well, we want to get the seniors and disabled to their jobs and so forth. And while I'm both, I, I think that. No, that's like when you're voting as a board commissioner and you see five options on the table, I voted based on my position, which was millennials and part-time workers and others. The other commissioners voted for what they thought. And whatever the majority is, is what the majority was at that moment. I don't disagree, but it did in invalidate or remove what I put on the table as being a target. It just became a secondary. Pay attention to how policy works. It didn't remove my casting of my vote. I was in the majority, in the minority at that time. I'm like, no problem. But don't act like it didn't exist, that it had no voice. That 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 whole thorn road didn't know. That thorn road was always there. It was always about the economic engine. It's just not around getting disabled and the seniors to jobs, but the seniors are already, they're coming down, they're trying to get off the engine, right? The disabled just want to get somewhat of an engine. But you got a whole set of part-time millennials and so forth that was part of that study. That, okay, why were they, I advocated for that. Okay, it, but it got put on a, well, we'll get to that in 17 and 18. Okay, I'll buy that. But, but, but stop with the saying that it, it, like, that voice didn't matter. I've been consistent with the voice. It says, well, wait a minute. How can y'all not start with this when this was the engine? The very fact that ARC came back validated my point. Like, having this thing run around the mall with seniors is not going like, oh, you can't, you can't fund that. You don't, ha you don't have the capacity. It didn't take a rocket science to figure like, no, but I couldn't do anything because one more time, well, let me get out y'all way. I'm, I'm in a minority position. That came back and sort of, it, it validated the very point. Why, well, y'all need to get over here to this throwing roll thing. That, that's that's like to, to, to say that it was only about that, which is fine as Madam Chair, as a pilot to start. I recognize that, okay, we'll get there to the other point. But to say that it didn't exist, that it was never on the table, is flawed. It's inaccurate. It was always at the table. I have always advocated for that area. So one more time, you can say that I don't want to hear it because I'm in the majority. And that typically what, what has happened for a period of time. That's fine. But now, as you say, you're going to recognize and reckon it was always there. It was always there. Sure. Right? That was important. Hey, you, Madam Chair, move, move up. We're, we're, we're. So we could close. Uh, I just had one, um, just one comment from you, if you could, um, Director Watson, if you could speak to the dollar ride portion. I believe that portion is specifically targeted our seniors, and we don't go directly to the doors. I think, what's the name of that? Flex. 
<coughs> you can you can either use flex or um, ADA paratransit yeah, service. Parents, yeah, ADA and that's your your right. That is for seniors and disabled, and they go through a certification process. And once they're eligible for that certification process, <coughs> you you do have a dial ride component where uh, a vehicle will come and pick them up at their door and and take them to where they can make a connection with the, the bus service. And I believe that component is part of that CMAC grant as well. It's like required. For, it's yes, a required. federal requirement. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because it goes straight to the doors. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I'll finish up. And thank you so much for your presentation. And thank you for what you do. You do for thank, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. All right. Any other questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners before I call and check with the attorney to see if we have executive session in place? Yeah. Okay. We do. That's okay. Um, Legal and uh, personnel. We do? Okay. At this time, do we have a motion to go into executive session? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, take a five minute break. Break it. Come back. Don't spill that coffee. No, but that's all right. This tab is just showing you, um, I just wanted to go back to 2015, even though we had trends all the way back to 2009, I believe, because of lovely SDS. Mm -hmm. It changed our percentages, you know, fire and EMS got pulled out of the general fund, placed into their own fund. So 2015 is when SDS started. So up here is your revenues, and we just, again, just for this model, we're just using general property taxes, local option sales tax, motor vehicle, mobile home, other tax revenues, and other general fund revenues. Tracked it from 2015, 16, preliminary for 17, because we're going to be closing the books this week. The budget for 18, and giving you the average trends. So as we talked about today, general fund or general property tax is about 50% of our revenue base, 19% for local option sales tax, 6% for motor vehicle, 5% for other tax revenues, and then 20% for all the other revenues that are not tax related. So that's where you get the average trend there. Then we started with the functions within government. General government did the same thing for 15, 16, preliminary for 17, the budget for 18, to get what we normally spend out of our budget. Like you see here, public safety is at just under 40%. We usually say 50%, but that's when we had fire and EMS in the general fund, so we have to pull that out. So that's why that percentage is a little bit is smaller than what we've been talking about. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the trends and where we get some of the numbers that we're going to be put in putting into this and capital. Budget. Oh, and capital, yes. Um, what I did here as well, well, this is not capital. What I did right here is I pulled out of this number the amount that we used to balance the budget fund balance because that's not going to be a recurring revenue. So I didn't want it to skew the percentages over here by including it down up here, if that makes any sense. Okay. It's just for 18, right? Just for 18. Yep. Uh -huh. Yes. Snap it bigger. Bigger, bigger, bigger. There we go. Okay. This is your projected expense analysis. We put over here the inputs. These are the input uh, rows and columns here. Then there's formulas in here um, that will calculate things. Um, what we did is we started with a base year on the expenditures. My base year is my 2018 budget. Then these are the numbers by function that you can change to project what each of the growth, if you had a 1% growth, you could do it all at the same percentage. You can do different percentages. You can do a minus percentage. I just kind of showed a variation so you could see that whatever you put down here, will mimic and calculate right here. Then you have your non-recurring expenditures, and that's going to be your capital items. <coughs> Again, I just took the 2018 budget, pulled out anything that was capital related, like the over a million dollars we gave for the share of vehicles, um, 
some road equipment for that new crew, mm -hmm. just some various things for capital, because we didn't want to capture it in recurring. We want to be able to pull that down here. These rows right here, we're going to be able to add whatever we want to add. You know, we just put some basic ones in here, asset replacement, infrastructure maintenance, infrastructure investments, capital investments, fund balance contribution. That's if we want to start building back our fund balance and we kind of treat it as an expenditure so that we bring it in, we're not going to spend it out. So we're going to put it there and then miscellaneous. But we've got it where we can add different rows for the different non-recurring expenditures. And then we'll play around with this in a little bit, but this is where you can change the percentage. One thing that, um, probably jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but one thing that David and I talked about after doing this version one <coughs> is that we're going to break down each of these functions into salary and benefits and to operating just because we feel like, you know, during budget time, sometimes we say, okay, departments are going to need to take a 2% cut in their operating budget, not mm -hmm. their total budget because you're not going to do, you're not going to do anything with salary and benefits. So we think that's going to give a better picture. But for right now, it is lumped in into one. A uh, quick question sure. on, that, on that screen. Um, what's the term? I'm trying to think of the term. If, if you if you change the second section, will it change the percentages in the first section and vice versa, or is it one way? In other words, uh, 2022, you got minus 1% in general government. If you change that to 2%, mm -hmm. does it change the money amount in the projected annual expenditures yes. in the second like the assumption and vice versa no it's only up here these are your only inputs okay whatever you put up here is going to take this base year and it's cumulative so you know it's one okay. percent and then it takes the information up here and puts okay, it down so one, here one way that's, one that's way. fine just so we know yes Jennifer, can you go back one, one sure. second i want to make sure we capture something for everyone. Okay. Earlier in the session, we talked about it's an expense-driven model. Mm -hmm. And so all of this was to get to ultimately to break down expenses between what's recurring and what's additional. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and, and you, we can, as Jennifer mentioned, we can custom this and put our, our, our hand down the rabbit hole as far as you want to go. Uh, but it's all to come up with that bottom annual expenditure mm -hmm. number, right? Whatever that number is, mm -hmm. and then we'll roll into what you were about to do. I just mm -hmm. want to make sure it's. This is the most to me. This is the most yeah. important part of the yeah. process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then the projected revenue. Um, we won't want at least one coverage, meaning that we want our revenues to equal our expenditures. Um, so it takes. What it's doing, it's taking your expenditures from the prior worksheet and it's saying, okay, you need that much in revenue. That's all For a balanced is. budget. For a balanced budget. Um, then, again, you see, can you, am I in your way? Oh, you're fine. Sure. You're fine. Okay. Um, then you have, again, you have a calculation row and then you, it lets you know what is calculated and what is input. You input the percentage breakdown of your local option sales tax, motor vehicle, other tax revenues, and other general fund revenues. Then whatever it takes to make 100% goes into your general property tax. So where I got this number, that's why I went ahead and did the trends. So you could see I pulled it from right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we can make any of these, any that we want to, but I just based it upon actual trends. But if we wanted to say, you know, what happens when local option sales tax, if it keeps trending downward because of the online sales and everything, what if this goes to 16%, then of course this is going to go up, you know, to 53%. Assuming that none of the other categories right. change as much. Exactly. So then it takes these percentages and it's just one way. Mm -hmm. You input here. And it calculates, okay, if you're telling me this is the percentage breakdown of my revenue, then this is how much you would need in property tax revenue. This is how much you're estimating for local option sales tax, motor vehicle, other tax revenue, and other general fund revenues to get to the revenue we needed to match our expenditures. Okay? 
Then, because as David said earlier today, general property tax is really the only levy that we have, we have control of. So we're gonna take this 43.2 million, gonna go to this spreadsheet, Then it takes that revenue that you saw on that prior spreadsheet, the 43.2 million, and we said 50% comes from property taxes. The prior year property tax billing was this. Millage rate was 11.267. Prior year value of one mil was 3.8. Again, this right here is an input. We can make that 2%, 1%. We can make it a negative. Uh, it's the growth of the digest, and it's new growth. We're kind of making the assumption right now we're rolling back for reassessment. If that policy or decision-making changes, then we'll need to tweak this spreadsheet to account for that. But when we're talking about growth in the digest, we're only talking about new growth. So you can factor in what you want. I put in 5% here, and I just highlighted that just to kind of remind myself, you know, 5% could be when the switch comes in. I don't know if that's going to be 5% or 15%, we don't know, but this you can put in the percentage of growth that you want to uh, estimate. Your collection rate, around 96, 97%, we left it at 97% all the way through. So this tells you your projected property tax revenues over or under projected. So we needed 43.2, we got 42.7 based upon a 97% collection rate and 2% growth in the digest. Yep would be short just under a half a million dollars. Yep. There's different ways that you fund this shortage. You can increase the millage rate, which that this is what the next section shows. It says, okay, if the value of a mill is 3.9 million, then it would take 0.12 mills to get you to break even. Yeah. Or you can go into fund balance. Right. Our total unassigned fund balance position estimating year in at 12.4. Our required fund balance policy minimum of 10% would be 8.6. Yep. So the discretionary available for fund balance to cover a shortage would be 3.8. Mm -hmm. So we have it in here, does the county meet fund balance policy? Yes, because we have the 10%, we have a surplus over and above the 10%. Yep. The shortfall is 475000 Is fund balance needed? Yes, because it, it goes up here and says, okay, if there's a minus here, then yes. It's just a recap, 12.4. If you used uh, your fund balance for your shortage, then you would be at 11.9. After you use this shortage, would you still meet your fund balance policy? And it's yes or no. Mm -hmm. That's based on the 10, though. I'm sorry? That's based on 10%, though. 10%. Right, okay, okay. Yes. Okay. The, the only other, again, the one option that's not on here is if you do find that you have a negative, the third option is to go back into the expenses. Right. Mm -hmm. And you lower the expenses. Right, right. 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 Yes. I didn't mention it, but that's mm -hmm. one of the options that you yeah. always maintain. Yes. And that's why another reason I want to separate salary and benefits out from operating right. because like I said, sometimes it's not like we want to lay off staff or furlough or anything like that. It may be that we go and look at their operating expenditures and say, okay, it's going to take a 5% cut across the board in order to get us out of the red. Right. Yeah. And and that's to, what we did in 2017. And, 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 to, and to your point, are these worksheets linked? So if you make that adjustment on, on your expense page, it, it shows up in the last page. Yes. So the formulas are linked. Okay. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. But, but furloughs and everything else still exist in ours. I mean, hopefully it's within the formula if we so choose to make that uh, part of the policy of where you go. It would. Yeah, okay, it okay. would now. It would just, what it does right now. Now, I'm not encouraging that. Okay. I, I understand. Okay. No, what it's doing now is it's saying this up here, like this minus one in uh -huh. 2020, or I'm sorry, 2022, uh -huh. it's taken 1% out of each function total budget, not okay. just salary and benefits and not just operating. It's taken their entire budget. Where what I would like to see is 
have it broken out by salary and benefits. Here's for general government totals this. For operating it totals this. So that if y'all want to ask the question of, okay, you know, if you're going to, you know, if you want to cut the budget and you say, I don't want to mess with employees right now. Okay. Let's see what an operating right. path would be. Right. Then you have that. Then if, if it's not enough, okay. Mm -hmm. What would be a one-day furlough mm -hmm. for everybody? Then we could separate that out. So we're actually going to have two different sections that you're going to be able to put percentages in. Understood. Right. Right. Well, now, the other thing, just to again mention, is the spreadsheets of, of the last two workbooks on this in this workbook absolutely probably won't change. Meaning. It's the expense sheet that you can custom and modify. I mean, you can modify all of it. Right. But it's how deep you want to put your hand into that expe right. expense sheet uh -huh. and at what level of detail, because it's all going to roll up to the uh -huh. point where you need a revenue number. Right. As long as they intertwine and, and, yeah. and can reference each other at yeah. whatever given time, like Commissioner Mulcair mm -hmm. stated, that, you know, if I make a change here, whatever the change is, it will reflect, you know, down below as to yeah. Not only where, but what. You so, know, so, in the general government, go back to the spreadsheet. This one? Or the expense? The expense. Okay. You know, hypothetically, and again, this is, we, we talk out loud when we construct this stuff, but hypothetically, you could have another tab for general government uh -huh. that has a, a whole series of yeah, that, a breakout of subtotals of, of, of sub, like your sub finance committee reports. Yes. 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 Then roll right. up into right. exactly. this spreadsheet. Exactly. It's just a matter of how deep of a dive you really want to go. But it, but at least it'll it'll clearly identify what we touched. <clears throat> yes. Within the subtotals of the general mm -hmm. versus generally uh, government or general general government, general government uh, it's just a number mm -hmm. versus the subtotals within the general government as to what it is that we touched within general government. Am I making sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so just yeah. We you know for for sake of clarity and numbers. Uh huh. See, because Kelly's a numbers guy. He, yeah. He, uh, Cal he, and Commissioner he, has he, stated this. Yeah. How far you want to put your hand in that rabbit That's, hole? It just yeah. never. Right. Right. It just for 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 the sake of. Because quite honestly, when you get out of 2028, 20, that's a pretty far period out yes. at that point. Right? So it's just a matter of how much you want to put your hand down that hole mm -hmm. and at what level of decision, decision mm -hmm. that you want to make. Salaries and benefits account for what? Se salaries and benefits? 70 to 70, 70 percent? 70, 70. Mm -hmm. Right? So beyond. Yeah. But that's an know, interesting number, though. That's, a, that's an interesting percentage. Yes. So. Yeah. So, yeah. I okay. think I, I think you know one of the, the, the sub goals of this is to make sure that we as a board commissioners can have a, a common language, a common understanding, uh, yes. an, an executive yeah. dashboard for mm -hmm. forecasting to a certain extent, making sure that our people will be here forever. We'll be able to institutionalize our practices mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a disciplined way. And I think Double you know help. top level, recognizing to Commissioner this point, yeah. they can go as deep as they want to. Right. But we need a common. We just yes. we're up here. We're just like sitting up there next to New World and let Michelle and them take you all the way like, okay, okay, can I come back up for a minute? And, and it, but, but you get the point. So I think um, to both of you's point, it can be, it's customizable to an extent. Y'all yeah, want to go deep. But we're trying to keep a consistent top level that we can always talk mm -hmm. and forecast. So That's why when we go on a budget retreat, you don't really hear us talk about a, a particular department, their supplies or their postage. Mm -hmm. right, that's right. just too deep for y'all. Right, right. And it's just, yes. you get totally too, too much, too totally much, agree. even though we look at it's it from, back. from yes. a, you know, yes. from a budgeting standpoint, and when you look at everybody's department that way, like we do, you can cut back and trim back. But at y'all's, we, we would probably have a two-week budget retreat if that was the case, if we went line yeah. item by line item. I want to tell you, I mean, out of, you know, probably, I'm just going to say on the surface, maybe about 200 governments that we are involved with at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, you're the first one that I've ever seen in a room. Even when I you know, even when I ran the city, I could not get everybody on the same like you know, at least with the language, mm -hmm. so that when we're we're having a discussion about what to fund or not fund, you know. Is it half four, half empty? Yes. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, just in terms of so we're all at least talking about the same yes. 
framework about where something fits. Mm -hmm. We're that, smarter than that. that, that well, I wouldn't no, that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Hey, you know, <laughs> you, or, or, or you, care, you, you care more. Yeah. I mean, I just, it is what it is. And so yes. I think it's a, a, a wonderful thing to have not just a tool, but at least have, we're all speaking the same language. It's, it's, so we have true we understanding of what, what this really is. Right. So, no. But, but, but to that point, I think the Commission Walker's point earlier, um, that we've all, uh, what I've noticed out of all of us, we all care about the numbers. Yeah. We've always mm -hmm. managed yes. to those numbers from different pe perspectives. Yes. But, but So that's the common thread you have that we don't want to miss on the numbers. Mm -hmm. What goes into it, that's, I mean, that's the whole point of our job. Yeah, we got, we got it. Yeah. But we don't, wanna, <laughs> we don't want to mess that up. So I think, right. yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Well, this will help future governors not mess it up. No, prom no promises. Right, right, right. right. You know, yeah, just, but it can see where things are and yeah. it can see why we, how we got to where we are based on, you know, the breakout, uh, the, the whole number, the spreadsheets. Because it, it's a one little stop shop that you can kind of look at and go like, hmm. Because I know sometimes I'm all in the, in the books trying to find the number. Like, okay, what that number reference that number? And versus a little one or two sheeter that you can kind of go like, oh, okay, I see. And I see the subtotals. If we so choose to take that route, not kind of see it with a glance versus trying to dig deeper and find it. Right. Now we find them because we all love numbers and we all love. What we call? Are we call Jennifer? Are no, we call Jennifer? <laughs> right. you know, I know the number should be in here somewhere. Now where is it? Part, part of what again at the, the book that you, you we provided for you uh -huh. goes back with the data that supports the trends yes, for the last nine right. years. Right? Yes. I mean, it's perfect, mm -hmm. but we want, had to go back far enough to figure out. Is 38 percent or 50 percent? You can clearly see after special service district, there's something something mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, yes. But depending on how you account for things, if somebody came in and said, "We're going to push the public safety budget hypothetically down to 24 percent," right. you know that's probably not realistic with right. where you've been. Right. It's just not. No. Right. 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 So, so putting that, you know, that's to keep people honest with the exercise. And keep us honest about truly is this realistic or is this really pie in the sky? Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. She really talking like mm -hmm. you, you'll never be able to get there based on that 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 number, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, so. I think as as a, you know our finance department, I mean, they've done a great job, guys. Yeah. You know that over the years since we you know since the recession, well that's our our, our common marker uh, to help provide us with information to make decisions. But now we get to go to a little bit more. Now we're that's when we didn't have nothing to work with, but now how do we make decisions going forward? And I think that this tool will help us. Uh, and, and so, as a tool, I mean, that was one of the things I wanted to make sure that they came back and addressed um, um, one, not only just a policy, um, but the, as a tool. Do you see what you were looking for? Yeah, yeah it's perfect. Okay. Can I get you to go back to, to the uh, expense analysis? Is that where we're here? The other thing that I want to mention is in the yellow section here, these non current revenues. Um, oh, I don't want to touch that. Um, <laughs> it's hard to resist. Yeah, it is. Uh, next thing you're going to see smudges on my TV screen at home. <laughs> I to do something. Uh, the, I referenced this capital improvement overlay or program. Mm -hmm. Is That would support what goes into this yellow because they're typically non-recurring expenses. Mm -hmm. So the capital program that you put together, a capital improvement program or plan, would project what numbers would actually go into this. Mm -hmm. And so you may see an initial investment here, but then may get rolled up in the here as a recurring investment. Yeah, because uh, we added a precinct for uh, mm -hmm. some officers. So that's exactly For like right. a fire station. Okay, mm -hmm. that's yeah. funded in yeah. Sloss, but then we're going to, and we've talked about that some, We've decided this may not just be capital in nature. Mm -hmm. I think that was the intent when we right. first started looking at this. But I think what we decided, let's just say the new total, fire station. Total cost. Yeah. Total cost. Let's mm -hmm. just say the, the new station is being built and paid for by Sploss. Right. But I think I've heard numbers like a million dollars to operate a fire station. Let's just use that for Romans. Say if that fire station is going to open in 2022, we might want to at least acknowledge the million dollars in operating down here. So it doesn't get lost up here and that we mm -hmm. don't have somebody come back and say, well, where's that million dollars? We show it here in the initial year mm -hmm. and then it gets jumps up, jumps up there as sure. the net. Yeah. 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 So I think, Perfect. you know, initially, like I said, we thought this was going to be, or I did anyway, thinking, okay, this is going to be capital in nature, infrastructure, you know, equipment, 
all that stuff. And I thought, no, I kind of like showing that first year operating separately than just lumping it in to one big number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The key is to acknowledge the expense. That, that's the problem is when we make a capital investment, but don't acknowledge or, you know, I'm going to buy a car, but I've got to include insurance. <laughs> Gas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Very good. Very good. All right. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you want to, any other questions? To the commissioners. Mike, Madam Guy. Who, who, uh, this is, this is a copyrighted edit. This is ours. Right. Did you build this yes. spreadsheet? Okay. Well, we tried to, you know, again, I know there's some comments earlier about econometric modeling and mm -hmm. statistical analysis. Uh, you know, again, having taught economics, uh, it, it's only as good as the folks that can use it at some level. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of econometric analysis that needs to be done on property taxes. It has its utility. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said because it's in Excel, if we go down the road and we say, hey, we need you to add this, you can easily add that. So part of that, and again, when we started this process in the beginning, uh, Commissioner Robinson and, and I think uh, Jennifer had indicated that they wanted a model that was totally customizable that they could go back into. If the, if the bus ever hit me or anybody at my firm, I could do that. <laughs> you, you go back. This is a, a bad word. I'm sorry. I mean, that word. I, was, I wasn't in here, but you could, you could, you know. Break the ice. You know, my 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 only my only uh, request of of, of uh, the, the county is, if you make a change, just make sure you let me know, so I can track the change. Because I mean, a year from now, if I look at this thing, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. I can pick it back up again. I should be able to pick it back up again. But some of the formulas that I've that we've written in here, mm -hmm. if you ask me to sit down right now and like write them out again, I don't. I probably couldn't. You have to catch me at a certain window mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Well, each window, has, uh, each cell has a, a formula yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got well, the beauty of it. So I you can <laughs> manipulate it. If you have to. Yes. But again, two two points to answer the question: licensing. Yeah, that's where I was going. All right, so Jennifer, um, or there was supposed to be an well, Mark. We were supposed to get an answer on licensing for this. Meaning, uh, the goal was that obviously this is statement work, and this is supposed to be our tool, our intellectual property. But there were some questions about licensing. How does, can somebody answer? Uh, I can answer. Please. Yeah, uh, in, in the contract with and, and David's heard this, and Jennifer and I got on a conference call Friday. Uh, in their contract, we basically say anything developed is proprietary to the county, so it's actually the taxpayer. So you can't, David couldn't license this to us. Also, because it's really, and this is sort of me cutting bolts, trying to decipher between the lines, it's essentially a uh, spreadsheet that has been inputted with materials. And I don't know that you could, I don't know that it's proprietary in nature now. If it was a software or something that spun it a certain way I and was patented and licensed it, then, then I think probably there's some proprietary there. But I think this is really in the public domain. It's a matter of inputting into a sheet, uh, a, a spreadsheet, the spreadsheet software that actually makes the calculations yeah. is proprietary. It existed, yeah. But it already exists in the public domain. Yeah, that's Excel. Yeah. And David agrees that the contract said that it couldn't be proprietary to term this. So my, my again my, my again my general concern I'm and, and we are on camera so this okay. so y'all know this open meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah I uh, again it is it's a model. Yep. And the formulas are specific and they're custom to what you have requested. Mm -hmm. If they're modified, I mean if somebody might I, I won't know. Right. It's, a, it's, it's sort of an and it would give out erroneous information, right? It's controlled. Right. Yeah. And, and see what happens with this, David, David and Jennifer. I kept correct me if I'm wrong. What happens is, if someone does a records request specific to this, and the normal way it goes over, it goes over in a spreadsheet. So you can already manipulate if you have a computer that's got a license to deal with excess spreadsheets. You can already manipulate the data. 
what David and them want to be terminus wants to be clear about is they're not they're not responsible for the juice that went into this model and if anybody misappropriates it they're not responsible for that either and I agree with him I say that on the record they, this is simply a tool that finance and y'all are using to try to come up with guesstimations that are based on more fact and science and just out in the domain but David and Terminus are concerned is if someone gets this in that format in Open Records Act request and uses their own Excel version to adjust it, we really can't control that because it's in the public domain. Well, you can control the software though. Uh, you can password it or maybe encrypt it or some other levels of security before before it's granted out uh, to the uh, the inquirer for, you know, right. for, for public records. They're, they're, they should have access to this, but not the program, not the spreadsheet, not the formulas. And probably they have access to these numbers. And our <coughs> license in probably requires that, Mike, is my guess. Mm -hmm. So we need to be careful by us to disseminate it out. Which, which is not slight. Major. You can PDF it to them. I mean, give them, give them that right there. Mm -hmm. and give them a PDF version and stuff. Yeah. Again, um, and leave it at that so we're not withholding information, we're giving them what you asked for. Right. But as far as the tools, no more different than the new world or anything else that Jennifer may do as well as to downloading the budget and so forth. You don't you don't give out that, do you? Yeah. No. I mean these the stuff that they use on an annual basis, but when somebody asks for the budget for 2018 or whatever, we just put it out there online, right? Because our our obligation is only provide them the document or the data or the material, whatever the physical thing is. Right. Our own licensing of Excel probably doesn't allow us to give their sauce out. So we probably need to check with the technology about how to do that. You know, I just don't. What happens on Open Records Act? It goes to somebody else. They'll they'll make the request and then they will send them something just to make sure everybody knows what we're doing on that. So why can't you just give them a PDF instead of the exact so same yeah. cell phone? Yeah. yeah. If you can correct PDF, you, that would be yeah. perfect. Yeah, fine. Can. Yeah. Because all they're privy to is the data, not the actual. So I think you yeah. probably want to direct it to the attention clerk. That's how it goes out in the PDF. Yes. Well, it'll come from, gen it'll come from us. Uh, yes. We'll turn it into PDF before we get to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Perhaps you can put cover on this document to that thing. Mm -hmm. the, the other okay. thing I would mention is you might want to put not approved by the BOC or something so that later on someone won't use this as an approved document. What it is is it's something y'all are using as a tool. It's a working so document. So it ought to have some kind of disclaimer on it okay. that this has not been approved by the board or whatever. And then this I think that cool. also will yeah. so I, tell I, I like issue. that. I like the disclaimer. It's not official. It's actually. Less yeah. whatever. Yeah. Right. So this is just for the rep. I, our firm, we have not finalized this yet. Right. It will be final shortly, but we wanted to make sure we had right. appropriate inputs from all of y'all before we sent you. Do you have a way whenever you send it over to us? Well, I guess you'll have the tool, right? Mm -hmm. Who would encrypt that on there that says not approved by the board? When it gets moved to a PDF or that's a, a that's a You can put it as a footer and then when it's going to put it on okay. there. Yeah. 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 There was a policy recommendation that was supposed to come forth, and there was this tool based on comments that came from other commission last time they saw it as this brings the conclusion of that statement of work. Correct. That is accurate. That is accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want for the commissioners to so they're done. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank appreciate you so much. Great time. presentation. No problem. Thank, thank you for having me. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you. Hey, you better tell me just go to my conference room. Y'all fed me. Any other questions for the board of commissioners? I've got to go get the gavel. Yep. The hammer. If there are no, other, no additional questions. Madam Chair, just this one. This meeting is. Wait for you. Okay, have one adjourn. Okay, one more. I have to get my official chair. Um,
Madam Chair, we may have one more, uh, I'm going to say under personnel and legal uh, matter we need to go back in the executive session on. It's just come up uh, before you adjourn. It's, you can't debate it. It's either we can go in by motion or not. Okay. So I just want to make you aware of that. It's a question of the county administrator. Okay. We have a motion to go into executive session. So moved. For as legal and personnel. For legal and personnel. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Stuart, yes. Yes. Thank you. We're back. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? With that being said, this meeting is adjourned.